after each Great, I heard the recording in progress. So recording is now. We should have a closed caption link shared in our chat for those who need it. Um, questions um, can be asked via our Q&A pod. Um, they will be answered or some of the ones that we can answer after each session. But those questions that we can't answer, we will still capture them. We will answer them, follow up with each presenter, and we will actually develop a document that we will share to you uh, following the event um, that you can go through and look at all the questions that uh, were asked and the answers from the presenters. Um, all presenters are gonna be in listen only mode, um, but that does not mean that you can't communicate. <laughs> so again, you have the chat box that is for chatting, connecting, um, any questions, uh, well, actually any questions go to the Q&A pod. If they're not in the Q&A pod, we are not gonna be able to answer them. So if you have a question, Q&A pod, if you wanna chat, the chat box. Um, let's see, and CLPs, that's a hot topic. Everybody wants to know about CLPs. This session uh, will give you three CLPs and CLPs will be provided to you a couple of weeks after the event. And so I'm gonna hand it back over to you, Mary. Thank you, Tanika. Just so our audience knows, throughout the event, we will be doing some polling and knowledge check questions. So please be sure to watch your screen, stay engaged, and do respond to these questions. It's a great way to let us know your feedback. In fact, let's try a poll right now. Take it away, Tanika. All right, let's do our first poll here. So I'm gonna pull it up. We're gonna have 20 seconds to get this answered. All right, so please indicate whether you represent an agency partner, an industry partner, GSA, or other. Okay, thank you. You guys are really engaged. <laughs> I'm about to end the poll at 20 seconds. Okay, let's share the results. Uh, looks like um, we have 38% are agency partners, these are the government agencies, 16% uh, industry partners, 28% GSA, and 18% other. So thank you. We have a diverse group here. So I hope you guys can learn a little something about security and protection. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing results here, and I'm going to hand it back over to you, Mary. Thank you, Tanika. Everyone feel free to close your poll window after each poll has been completed. It won't affect anything um, and it will clear your screen to see what's being displayed. It is now my pleasure to introduce Irv Kaler, Assistant Commissioner for the Federal Acquisition Service in the Office of Customer and Stakeholder Engagement. Welcome, Irv. Thanks, Mary. So as we get uh, kicked off today, I'd like to thank our partners from DHS for coming on over and they're gonna do some pretty cool presentations for us uh, this afternoon on the security, <coughs> uh, excuse me, category. And uh, with that, let's go ahead and advance to the next slide. So while we get kicked off on this series, uh, we're really focused on category management and uh, overall across the government. So that's why you see us partnering with our uh, category manager from DHS today. So some of the things that we like to talk about is the value of the underlying contracts themselves. Uh, it's a trusted and transparent environment. So you get compliance, 889 parts A and B certified, uh, TA enforced. This is not uh, a, a perfect, world that we live in, but we are working incredibly hard with uh, third party risk tools. Um, we do scans of things on advantage and we really get deep into uh, sort of what's going on. Again, it's, it's, it's an imperfect science, but we're working incredibly hard to make sure the supply chain is secure. And that is a particularly important uh, aspect for today's presentation. Um, we regular, regularly post our compliance dashboards. If you need links to those, uh, we'd be happy to share them. Now we have fair and reasonable pricing. We do a lot of statistical analysis and modeling across all contracts mm -hmm. and markets to ensure that our um, contracts are at a fair and correct uh, price. Then, then we have the spend under management and best in class, and I'll, I'll get to that a little bit more in a minute, but the GSA contracts specifically are uh, almost all certified as either spend under management or best in class. So if you need those OMB credits, uh, please come on over and we'll, we'll take care of you. And then, excuse me, 
uh, an easy to find industrial base with qualified partners. What does this mean? If you come to us uh, with, at GSA, the multiple award schedule uh, industrial base has at least two years of experience. Uh, and so you're, you're getting someone who has the requisite capabilities, financials and other things to meet your needs. When you get to the max and GWAX, we've increased that to, to the five-year uh, standard. And then it's really across multiple domains as well. What we're trying to do is make sure that when we have those uh, more highly intense or complex requirements, we have the right industrial base that's easy to find to meet your needs. So let's go on to the next one, Mary. So why spend under management and best in class? I have a pretty regular d debate with some of my uh, agency partners that say, Irv, the spend under management isn't for me. It's just a, a goal to, to hit, and that doesn't really make a difference. And today is one of the times where I can say, ah, it does make a difference. Use of the contracts and the score with OMB by itself, uh, it, it's sort of a, a reasonably accurate statement that that's not making the biggest difference in the world, getting the credit. However, when we're using those contracts, we're collecting data on the back end uh, to help drive enhancements across the category. You're starting to see samples and templates that are improved. Uh, and so you're getting events like this one that are less about the contract itself and more about how to buy in the market. What are those tips and tricks? The things that you really need to know if you're gonna buy a, a canine service as an example, uh, because it's a very unusual thing and there's a lot that goes into it. So the use of these spend under management and best in class contracts allows us to collect this information, start to uh, segregate it, analyze it, and then feed it back to you so that we can build a better federal marketplace and really improve the buying experience. And this is both for industry and for, for our federal agents. All right. I don't, I don't know if that was uh, me or everybody got kicked off, but <laughs> Mary, can you still hear me? Yes. Sorry, or uh, we were able to get up. Uh, we were all back. I think you froze and then it dropped you. So apologize for that. Uh, no problem. So you, you know, just to wrap up, hopefully you caught the the majority of this slide that uh, you're seeing the. So you go to the next one. So one of the things that we've really focused on this year are the acquisition planning packages. And we've picked up uh, a fair amount of feedback from the uh, polls that you're answering here to know what belongs in these packages. They cover facilities, office management, professional services, security, uh, information technology, and we add more um, almost every week. And so you're going to get here some sample statements of work, some sample RFQs, and again, other tips and tricks that will allow and help you perform the acquisition um, more easily. And this is good for whether you're a program person who needs some good market research, uh, which you can get here and we can help you in some other ways. And it's also good for contracting officers who need to say, hey, what are those evaluation criteria or what's going on in the market? So this is an incredible resource and we're are really doubling down uh, after we wrap up the training series next. We're gonna enhance the ones that are there. So thanks in advance for your uh, engagement and participation and know uh, that we're using this information to make it better. So back to you, Mary. Thank you, Irv. Appreciate that, and we're sorry for those little glitches. Occasionally, those happen with Zoom, so just bear with us if that should happen. Next up, it is my pleasure to introduce Ms. Tina Cox from the Department of Homeland Security. She is currently the Acting Category Manager for Security and Protection Category. Tina, take it away. Thank you. Um, I want to say hello and good afternoon to everyone. Again, my name is Tina Cox, and as mentioned, I am the Acting Government-Wide Category Manager 
for security and protection. I appreciate the opportunity to give you guys a very brief overview of our category. This category focuses on cross-agency collaboration to streamline all activities and to generate efficiencies in support of commodity and service needs for law enforcement and military activities, personnel and property protection, and security. Within our category, we're responsible for the subcategories of ammunition, protective apparel and equipment, security animals and related services, security services, security systems, and weapons. Next slide, please. We have four best-in-class contract vehicles within our portfolio. We have our Body Armor 3, or BA3, and it protects the people who safeguard the nation with an array of soft body armor configurations to meet specific mission needs. We have our Reduced Hazard Training Ammunition, or our, our HTA. It provides lead-free green ammunition to ensure that armed workforce receives quality training ammunition alternatives. We also have our Tactical Communications Equipment and Services 2, or TACCOM 2, and it ensures end-to-end -end transmission of mission-critical voice, video, and data with access to cutting-edge tactical communications equipment and services. And finally, we have our Technical Investigative Surveillance Equipment 2. For our tech ops too, and it helps agencies achieve mission success with customizable surveillance techniques and technologies. Next slide, please. Here, I just want to give you a snapshot of the spin trends for the last fiscal year and to date for this fiscal year. Give you just a minute to take a look at that. So I want to zero in on the percent of our small business spend. Um, we have about 29% for ammunition, 85% for protective apparel and equipment, 37% for security animals and related services, 22% for security services, 27% for security systems, and 14% for weapons. With for FY20, about a 6.3 billion overall spend and 24% of that went to small business. As we look at FY21, it does appear that we're trending in a similar spend path for that FY, uh, with the exception of one anomaly and that's security animals and related services. And uh, we'll see how it turns out, but I expect this to change over this final quarter, quarter of the FY. As you can see, we're only at four point about 4.6 billion in our spend so far. Another minute. Okay, can we go to the next slide, please? So now I would just like to take this opportunity to leave you with some selective trends, as well as the challenges we see within the category. Um, looking across the federal landscape, uh, we're seeing an increased use of qualified products lists or QPLs. Longer periods of performance are becoming more common among our contracts. We're seeing agency level commodity councils stood up to develop and implement a broader strategy for more effective and efficient acquisition, coordination, sustainment, and utilization of commodities and services. There are standardization efforts in weapons, ammunition, and even training targets. Some agencies are moving to modular firing ranges and the use of mobile skiffs and transitioning from x-ray systems to commuted tomography or the CT systems. Agencies have consistent requirements for physical security systems, personal protective equipment, and of course, small arms, weapons, and ammunition. At the government-wide category level, uh, we're focusing our efforts on creating centers of excellence in each of our subcategories. The objective is to stand up a working group of government subject matter experts who will capture all the processes, policies, best practices, as well as challenges within the subcategory. A part of this is to include to collaborate with industry so that we can understand how we can better partner 
to create meaningful and actionable business intelligence within each area of security and protection. A few of the challenges we're seeing in this category are related to the National Defense Authorization Act, NDAA, Section 889A1A, the prohibited equipment, which has significant impact to our ability to purchase and field telecommunications equipment and video surveillance cameras, unmanned aerial systems, or UAS, counter unmanned aerial systems, or CUAS. We have a critical need for access to secure, trusted, and reliable small unmanned aerial systems, essential to national defense and commercial industries. Looking forward, industry partners should focus on building trusted supply chains. We need to be develop a QPL for counter unmanned aerial systems that contains equipment that does not violate the national airspace system or the NAS and complies with 18 USA, USC and also provides the required performance. In my discussion with some of the government subject matter experts, a consistent message that I heard is that it would be optimum if our industry partners are able to know the laws and any impacts or violations of their systems. This dialogue will help us all find solutions. There are a lot of concerns as UAS technology is increasing at, at an exponential pace. Every year, the speed, payload capacity, navigation ability, and endurance increases. This problem forces us to look for novel and rapid approaches for testing. The future will require increased collaboration to identify and resolve the obstacles encountered on many fronts within the UAS and CUAS environments. For the foreseeable future, these areas will represent very complex problem sets and challenges to meeting our emerging requirements. We will also have to exercise flexibility in incorporating the new executive orders, driving us to focus on strengthening America's supply chains and sourcing made in America. We certainly have a rapidly changing security environment, and I think the events of today illustrate how important it is to encourage innovation so that we can be in front of the risk we face as a nation and keep our citizens safe. Next slide, please. This concludes the brief overview of the security and protection category. I truly appreciate the opportunity to share with you. Thank you for taking the time to listen and I look forward to your questions. All right, uh, thank you, Ms. Cox for all the great information. Um, I'm kind of eyeing the questions here and um, I think we have one, uh, Mary, if I'm correct, uh, it says, the document, I'm not sure what the document is, the document that's showing it's not valid for the 21st century. You know, everything, I'm sorry, I'm trying to read this. Hey, you know what? Like, we didn't have any direct questions. Um, Ms. Cox, there was some uh, folks that couldn't see slides, so we're working on that technicality. Um, but at this point, we will thank you very much for the presentation. And if we have questions afterwards that come our way, um, we will definitely get those over to you. Um, we are going to, I'm going to throw it back to Tanika because she actually has some polls to measure the audience industry, both agency partners and industry partners on their interest with getting involved with the working groups or the commodity councils that you are forming around security and protection. So stand by for those results. Um, and Tanika, take it away with those polls. Okay. Thank you again, Ms. Cox. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm sorry to uh, interrupt again, but I think we have two relevant questions that just popped up. Mary, are you okay with me proceeding with those or did you want me to jump to the polls? Uh, yeah, go ahead, Tanika. Okay. I'm glad we have some questions. Sorry okay. Uh, felt bad. I was like, T I know Tina has some questions. So, <laughs> so here we go. Um, one question is, what is the big difference between a CT scan and x-ray scans? Um, well, the, the CT scan and the x-ray, I'm not quite sure, to be honest with you. I just know that it's a more advanced technology and uh, it requires, um, a, a, it gives us a deeper look, I guess, a more, um, 
if, I don't know, the best way to say this, this is definitely not my expertise, but uh, I, I think it gives us a clearer picture, maybe, of what we're what we're looking at. It gives us a better idea uh, if things are getting through. We can we can identify things more readily. Maybe maybe a more speedy process of getting things through the system for us to to identify what's what we're looking at. If that makes sense. Okay. Great. Thank you. We have one more um, before we get to the polls. As a security integrator, we are seeing an increase in a number of systems being, not sure what that abbreviation is. Um, is the government trying to streamline mm -hmm. and formalize systems? It's kind of loaded, so <laughs> maybe a follow-up question. Uh, some of these questions are very specific to the person, so I'm not sure if you're able to unpack that. If not, we can move on to the polls and we'll get these answered uh, some of these questions that are very very specific to mm -hmm. requirements i'm i'm not prepared to discuss that right right i'm certainly open to having them shoot me an email or if you guys collect the questions that are that specific and i can farm those out to the SMEs that that manage these yep. areas sounds good so we'll do that and actually um that was my next segue before we get into the polls because what we do is we develop a q a document and so we allow presenters to kind of unpack your questions because we do get a lot of questions that are very specific to your needs. <laughs> and like Tina said, she will have to, you know, link up with some of the subject matter experts. We'll get those answered and we'll get them posted shortly after the event. Um, but like Mary said, we do have three poll questions uh, that we're going to ask. Okay. And the first one is regarding, well, they're all regarding commodity councils and a working group opportunity. So I'm gonna launch this poll here and read it. Uh, would you be interested in joining a working group for the security and protection category focused on unmanned aircraft systems? I'll give you 20 seconds to answer that. And by answering this question, of course your information will be forwarded. or an opportunity to participate. So I'm gonna end the poll here, share the results. And so it looks like around 43 individuals are interested in participating in that working group. So that can be a great opportunity for you. Okay, I'm gonna stop sharing these results and I'm gonna to go to the next question. And this is in regards to a K-9 working group. A working group is being formed around the K-9 working dogs category. Would you like to join this group? So I'm giving you 20 seconds. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll at 20 seconds. Okay, it looks like 21 of you are interested in joining this working group. That sounds fun. Okay, sharing the results here so you can kind of see. Okay, and then I'm going to do the last poll. Commodity councils. Let me launch it first before I read it. <laughs> Please select all that apply regarding your interest in participating in commodity councils. This is multiple choice. So it's really asking you to identify kind of who you are. I'm an industry partner interested in joining, um, interested in learning more about it. Okay, we passed our 20 second mark there. Uh, but here are the results. Let me share them here. Okay. Looks like a lot of folks said, I am with a government agency and interested in learning more about the government commodity council roles. And second, um, I'm an industry partner interested in learning more about government commodity council roles. All right. So we're done with the polls and thank you again to Ms. Tina Cox. We really appreciate your participation. Um, and I'm gonna move on to uh, hand it over to Mary. Thank you, Tanika. And thank you again, Tina. Appreciate you both. 
It is now my pleasure to introduce our next presenters, all from GSA, Mr. Daniel Stafford, Section Chief, Mr. Jared Bush, and Mr. Ken Miller, both Lead Contract Specialists, and Ms. Chrisanne Neswadomi, Business Development Specialist from our Security and Protection Categories. Today, they will be presenting to you how to find what you need for the Security and Protection offerings. Thank you to each of you, and the floor is yours. Great, good morning, thank you so much. And thank you, Tina, it was great getting to hear from you this morning, I appreciate that. Uh, welcome, and I would just like to uh, thank you all for joining us. My name again is Chrissy Ann Neswadomi, and I'm a business development specialist with GSA Case, and we promote the schedule solutions that are here in our region in which the security and protection category happens to be one of those. So we are going to be moving on and uh, hearing from our subject matter experts. The first thing up will be in guard services. But before we do that, I wanted to let you know about GSA multiple ward schedules, just some basics to make sure that we're all on the same playing field and understand the terms and what we're talking about. So to get started, a GSA multiple award schedules are indefinite delivery, indefinite, indefinite quantity IDIQ contracts. They were awarded under FAR Part 12, the acquisition of commercial items, and also FAR Part 15, contracting by negotiation. So we have been working through all that, that process. So with the big takeaway that I'd like you to know is that we have done those behind the scenes steps so that we can make the procurement process much easier for you. So, so starting off, let's look at who can use the schedules. So basically federal and local entities, or federal and the military, and also state and local governments through the Cooperative Purchasing Program and through the Disaster Recovery Program. We can also work with educational institutions and tribal organizations. But if you'd like to see the list of that, you can always go to this that will be shared later is the eligible entities that are in the GSA order that list all those specifics. So one of the, the big things is why should we use schedules? What is the benefits of using the schedule program? So we're looking at FAR 8.4, the federal supply schedule versus FAR Part 15, contracting by negotiation. Those are different steps. We have worked very hard to make sure that our contract pricing is fair and reasonable so we can provide that savings to you. There's flexibility, lots of choice, but one of the big things that I wanna mention is that it saves time. Again, we want to focus in that we're making it easier for you to do your job. So one of these examples, we were working very hard to get in front of a customer at the Washington Navy Yard to let them know, just like what we're talking about here, what are the reasons that you should use GSA schedules? So we finally got that meeting. We were talking to two different divisions and we were getting ready to start presenting a slide similar to this. And then the one division started saying, you know what? This saves so much time. We're talking a difference between an 18 month procurement down to a six month procurement. So if you're not using it, you're wasting so much time. At that point, we could just sit back and let them talk about and basically sell the benefits of using it. But that is such, a huge benefit is saving that time so you can move on to all the other demands of your time. Um, there's also, you know, we have all the different socioeconomic classes and categories on our contracts and about 83% of our contractors are small businesses. So that gives you a good idea of what we have. So let's see, moving on. On the um, Ordering procedures, they're listed in FAR 8.405, and it gives you all the specifics. And then basically, as far as it's listed in FAR 8.002, is that the priorities of use for the mandatory government sources, if you check and it's not available through Unicor or Ability One, then you can go to the federal supply schedules, which is also what we call the multiple award schedules. Uh oh. 
having a little issue here. Okay, again, talking about wanting to make it easier. So I have a graph here and this just helps me looking at the breakdown of how to go about ordering from the GSA schedules. So if it's below the micro purchase threshold, 10,000 or less, you're just going to go out and award to any mass contractor that meets your needs. Now what we call our little sweet spot is between the micro purchase and the simplified acquisition threshold, 10,000 to 250,000. And at that point, you're just going to send out an RFQ to a minimum of three GSA contractors. That's it. If it's over the simplified acquisition threshold, you're going to post that RFQ on eBuy or you can send it to as many GSA contractors as you can. And once you do in all of these scenarios, you're just going to make the best value determination and then document your files. So there's a lot of wording and a lot of uh, far reading that you can do, but having it broken down into a little chart or graph like this, you know, makes it easier. Okay, so let's get down to where's my stuff. So we're going through these basics and if you're a contracting officer, you're just thinking, okay, I just need to know where my information is. How do I do what I need to do? So where's the solicitation? What are the FAR clauses that were included in the contract? Do you have any sample documents that I can use to make it easier? If you're the end user, you're looking at what do you have on contract? Where can I see what's available and how can I get it? For industry, you're always looking at how do I get in touch with the customers? How do I know and let them know what I'm offering? Where's the solicitation? So what I want to tell you is how can I help? I, I can't do your job for you and you wouldn't want me to, but I can show you ways to make it easier. And so what I'd like to do real quick here is show you some of the resources that are available so you can go and find that information that you're looking for. So we'll just start off basically by going to GSA eLibrary. There is so much information on eLibrary that it can be a, a go-to for so many situations, but basically you can see right here, you can do a search right here in the search bar and I put in security guards just for our example and it will pull up information on that. If you go ahead and go over to the side there, you will see where it says select a contract vehicle. If you click, if you click on the multiple word schedule, it will take you to information regarding the GSA schedule contracts. So when you get there, you have a choice here. Do you want to look at the cl contract clauses or would you like to look at the solicitation? So if you are a contracting officer and you want to see what's included in the solicitation, what does it actually say? Or maybe if you're interested in becoming a GSA schedule vendor, you can click on this portion right over here where it says contractors. And when you do, it will take you to the multiple award schedule solicitation. From here, you can view it online, you can download it, read it to your heart's content, see what's actually there. So if we go, well, let's see, I wanted to go, anyway, the other choice that I was showing you was to go to contract clauses. So you can either look at the solicitation or look at the contract clauses for the actual contractor. So if you know the contractor's name that you're interested in, you can go right here where we have it alphabetized. For example, I'm looking here on the T's. I see find my contractor, I go over to view and it will show you the clauses. So here's an example of how that looks. So again, you can view them, you can download them, print them up for your use, but you can see exactly what is included. So you are familiar with what it, and you feel comfortable making the type of decision that you, that you need to as a contracting officer. Okay, so one of the things that Irv mentioned in, when he was opening up was about our acquisition planning packages. So with these planning packages, we have sample documents, there's market research, and there's ordering guides. And like he mentioned, this is one of our um, security and protection categories happen to be listed there. So what you can do when you go to the website there to get access to these packages, I went ahead and did the one, highlighted the security and protection over here. And there happens to be one for guard services, 
So when you are visiting that site, if you will just download the guard services there and you'll see where it has here information on an RFI. Say you needed to post an RFI, what are people saying in that? What are some examples of that? How about a statement of work, performance work statement for security services? What have people included? What is some additional information that would help me do my procurement? So that kind of information is available to you through the planning packages. So here's some, you know, again, some of the information that is included. RFIs, RFQs, sample statements of work. One of the things I really like are the different ordering guides, buyer's tips, things to think about when you're making a procurement that sometimes, you know, as CEOs, you are handed so many different categories of items to purchase. There's no way you can know all the ins and outs, but these will give you those little tips and tricks to help you along your way. We are continuously working on improving these, updating the content. We want to make sure we have the most current and helpful, useful resources available to you. So as a contracting officer, that is something you can really use to help you in your acquisition planning. So if you're the end user and again, you're looking at where can I find what you have on contract? Hey, GSA Advantage is our online ordering system. You can do a search here. It's, whoops, whether you want to do products or services, you just enter in the search engine, hit go, hit the little looking glass, and you'll find those products and you can search through that. Something else I wanted to mention to you that we're pretty excited about is we have what we call market research as a service. Now this is a value added service that we do for you that is free of charge, no additional cost. And what we can do is post an RFI for you. You can include technical questions that you're just trying to, to find out what's going on in the market. We can include that in the MRAS and what's great is it comes back as a really nice report with these visuals included that answers those questions that you have about that particular category and it gives you an idea of who's out there and what they can provide. We also have other services where we can do a, a rapid review to see if what you're looking for is within scope of one of our GSA solutions. And then we also do a GSA Advantage product market research where it can search up to 20,000 items on GSA Advantage and let you know, is that product available? So you can get in touch with me business development. We also have customer service directors for every area that will be able to help you. So whatever we can do to assist you, and again, the word, make it easier for you to do your job. That is what we would like to do. Okay, I do have a list here of some just helpful resources, things that I talked about right here. But now I'd like to move on and let you talk to those subject matter experts that can really get into the details of the security and protection category. And uh, we'll just take it from there then. Next up is Daniel Stafford. While he preps his screen, just so some of you are having who are having trouble seeing some of the slides, we are working to get the slides up and available so that you can follow along on your own copy. Once that link is ready, I will be sharing that in the chat. So hang in there. I'm glad you're hanging in there with us. Daniel, take it away. All right. Thanks, Mary, and thanks, Chris Ann. Um, and, and yeah, I'm going to echo what Chris Ann said about making your job easier for the uh, customers, potential customers in the audience, the 38%, uh, uh, at least at the beginning here. Uh, so I'm going to talk about guard services, but before we dive in, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the other services that we have in our category. Um, we've got the purchase and installation of alarm detection and surveillance systems as well as physical access control systems. Uh, we offer law enforcement support services such as fingerprinting, forensic analysis services, and investigative services. We also have all the products that support law enforcement officers, firefighters, and the military. Uh, if it's commercially available, you can find it underneath our security and protection umbrella with the exception of two items, and that's live ammunition 
and firearms. Um, other than that, uh, if you can't find it, work with us and we'll work with our vendor partners through the RFI process or through capability uh, statement requests to get those items added to contracts for you. Uh, for let's get into the guard services or protective services services occupations. Uh, so these are the labor categories that you'll find on our contracts. And if they look familiar, uh, that could be because they come from the Department of Labor's Directory of Occupations. And this is important because the work that's done by these labor categories is subject to the Service Contract Act, uh, SCA, also the Service Contract Labor Standards. So if you're using another labor category in your RFQ or you receive a response to an RFQ with a different name, uh, just know that at some point you'll need to map it to one of these labor categories um, in the Department of Labor's Directory of Occupations, uh, and that's done using the tasks that they're performing. Uh, and this is so that the minimum mandatory wage requirements can be properly administered. Uh, so let's take a look at that uh, Directory of Occupations now. Okay, so I, I find this just by searching on Directory of Occupations and it will bring up this PDF. And then I go to the 27,000 series, which is protective services occupations. And you can see those labor categories here. Uh, conveniently, it's also got the tasks that are performed. So if you're not using these names, you can look at the duties or tasks that are commonly performed by these labor categories and then match them up to your requirement. It's also a great place to start when you're defining your requirement. No need to reinvent the wheel. Um, so you can see those labor categories here, uh, again, with the description of the duties performed so that you can then know which wage requirement applies to that individual. So as I go back and forth between these tabs here. Okay, so, uh, so if you're a CEO, um, can you write your own contract or use an existing contract vehicle for guard services? Of course you can, but you do so at your own risk. Uh, and I say this because, um, you know, which WD are you going to incorporate? Which one applies? And what if there's a revision issued by the Department of Labor? How does that get incorporated? GSA has incorporated all of the wage determinations published by the Department of Labor, and they're all incorporated into our contracts already. Um, and we have an agreement with the wage and hour division of the Department of Labor to update all the WDs on an annual basis. So that's already done again at the contract level and it flows down to the task orders. Uh, let's take a look at where you can find that um, on GSA's website. So through our available offerings page, this is our solicitation information. We've got the attachments to the solicitation and right here incorporated by reference, you'll see all the wage determinations that are published by the Department of Labor. And if we click on one of these, it's gonna bring up the wage determination and it's gonna give you, depending on which one you select, depending on the county where your requirement is, it'll give you the minimum wage requirements for each of the labor categories. So again, this, this will um, help you stay compliant with the Service Contract Act. They're already incorporated. You just need to know which WD applies to your requirement, and that's gonna be based on the location. Apologize as I go back and forth. This next slide will show you um, that again, the location is also gonna uh, be a big determinant in what the task order awarded pricing is, because you can see here, I took an excerpt of a WD from Maine and one from California, and these are the different man minimum mandatory wage requirements uh, in the SCA. So depending on where your location is, uh, which WD is applicable, that's going to be a factor in your awarded task order pricing, of course, depending on competition and your statement of work. Okay, so the GSA mass contracts are IDIQ contracts, uh, indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity, all the clauses, uh, terms and conditions are gonna flow down to the task order 
they're already incorporated. So the task order, you define your requirement. You can add more terms and conditions, more clauses as needed. Um, and then the nationwide scope, that's gonna be based on all of the WDs that are incorporated. So it promotes compliance with the Service Contract Act and all of our contractors are basing their GSA price on those WDs that are incorporated. So again, your task order price is gonna depend on the location among other factors. So order level materials, materials that's one of our newer SINs um, and that allows for unforeseen items that come up during performance of a contract to be acquired via the GSA contract order. A good example is masks and gloves during COVID that weren't known at the time of award. Uh, they can actually now, instead of going open market, they can be procured via the contract order uh, as a GSA solution. Okay, and then we have uh, eBuy is our online RFQ system. This allows you to post your requirement. It allows you to have your question and answers, your addendums or attachments, any specs or drawings can all be uploaded to your acquisition in eBuy. I've gotten great feedback from customers who say they, they love eBuy, especially compared to FBO or now beta.sam or sam.gov. Um, you can even award your, your order from eBuy. So it's uh, your manager whole acquisition, pre-award up to award in one place. Um, and now I'll turn it over to my colleague, Ken Miller, who brings a unique perspective uh, as he was formerly a CEO here in the security and protection and now he's one of our customers. Take it away, Ken. Is Ken on the line? Hey, Daniel, this is Chris Ann. Yeah, I'm not sure if it, Ken was going to be able to join us right now, um, but let, hold on. I'm okay. going to, I'm chatting him right now. So he's going to see if he can join just a second. Okay. We may be able to come back to his too during the case study portion. Hey, sorry about that, folks. Occasionally, security and protection gets called away for noble, for noble duties. Correct, right, Daniel? That's right. <laughs> That's great. Well, while we're waiting, we did have a, a couple questions that I thought maybe we could go ahead and, and talk about. Um, let's see. One of them says we have a GSA contract. One of the challenges is that IDIQ bundle open awards compete from GSA contracting, compete with GSA contract schedule. Um, I'm not exactly sure what exactly they're talking about there. Daniel, does that sound familiar mm -hmm. to you? So, I'll, well, I'll try to answer that. So there is, um, so GSA schedules, we used to compete against the open market. Uh, that was a big competitor of ours. Now with the spend under management initiative or some uh, federal spend is being tracked and we're trying to get away from open market acquisitions. Um, now, so there are customers who have been buying open market. Now they're realizing, okay, I need to use an existing contract vehicle, which GSA schedule is. Uh, we're a tier two solution versus tier zero when you're open market. Uh, there are also vendors who have been selling to customers open market who are saying, my customers are telling me I need to get on the GSA schedule. Again, that's because of the spend under management. Now the prices, uh, the services and products need to be priced on a contract. Otherwise they would be open market but we can always add them via the modification process. So if it's not already priced and awarded, then it would be open market. Um, but if it, again, there's the OLM SIN for items that are unforeseen. We also have an ancillary items SIN uh, for things that go along with the total solution uh, and aren't meant to be standalone. Uh, it could be found maybe in another category. So we have a lot of flexibility to provide a total solution and uh, just know that the federal government is trying to get away from open market acquisitions as a whole. Key point, this is Steve Bartley. I'm gonna chime into that. I like to say that we don't have any competition. In the context of guard services, for example, a lot of government agencies 
go on the open market through SAM.gov and we find out there that they are using GSA contractors for their open market contracts. So why do that? You're reinventing the wheel when you don't have to. We've already got about 108 currently offering various types of uh, guard service solutions. So come to GSA and just like Daniel said, we can modify a contract to fit what you're looking for. So you don't have to have uh, this uh, per perception, that what I call a false perception of total control of my contract. When you utilize a GSA contract, you can engage the contracting officer directly. Go through Daniel, for example, and talk to him about what you're looking to looking to do, uh, even at the point when you're writing your statement of work, when you're formulating that requirement based on whatever your allocated budget calls for, reach out to GSA at that point. You've got to follow FAR Part 10 anyway for your market research. So before you even start writing your acquisition plan, your DNF, whatever uh, internal policy uh, you got to meet in the procurement laws, regulations, policies, and executive orders, GSA can help you make that much easier. Just like uh, Chris San illustrated earlier using FAR 8.4, uh, it makes my life a whole lot easier. I can tell you when I was writing contracts for forestry service, we had requirements for fire helmets and you know in the, in the heart of fire season, uh, it becomes life and death if they don't have a, a functional helmet. So being a fairly new contracting officer back in the early, you know, the mid early 2000s, I discovered the GSA schedule program when a lot of my colleagues were writing open market contracts through FedBizOps, taking, you know, nine, 18 months to do that and writing either our requirements or an IDIQ contract. I discovered the blanket purchase agreement solution as an alternative. It took me three months to write a, contra a BPA for fire helmets, which could have taken me nine or 18. And again, the illustration uh, Christine gave about the Navy writing uh, requirements for uh, boats and motors, uh, same applies. It'll take you typically the, a third amount of the time using GSA to write a BPA or even a, a task order. Thanks, Steve. Oh, that's great. And I, I just got message. There is Ken Miller joining us now. Perfect. I apologize for my tardiness. Uh, where we're at, and are we going to talk a little bit about uh, conducting the acquisition? As uh, Daniel already mentioned, my name is Ken Miller, and I'm a team lead and contracting officer for GSA as part of the Federal Acquisition Service uh, Assisted Acquisition Division. Some of the things that you should consider when creating your RFQ are the place of performance. You wanna know the specific location services are required to include the state, city, and the county. As Daniel mentioned earlier, this will aid you immensely in selecting the appropriate SCA wage determination for your specific requirement. Next, you need to know what you're asking for. There should be clarity in your performance work statement to include the level of labor effort and which service contract act labor categories are required for your particular requirement. You also wanna plan for the unexpected, but find comfort in knowing that you can utilize the order level material SIN when applicable. Uh, using the order level material SIN allows ancillary supplies and services, not known at the time of award, to be included and priced at the order level. You want to avoid vague language in your performance work statement. This would be language that could be interpreted differently by the parties involved. Also, know and understand what you expect from each labor category. Again, this should be spelled out in your performance work statement. Later on in this presentation, I will give you a few specific examples of vague language we use in our requirement, as well as what happens when labor category expectations are not clearly defined and the potential both issues cause. Lastly, if you require proof that the contractor is licensed in the state in which they are providing services, this can also be an RFQ requirement. A little later in this presentation, again, I will be providing some lessons learned as a result of a multiple award BPA, my office awarded against the law enforcement schedule, and I'll provide specific examples that may assist you further concerning RFQ considerations. Back to you, Daniel. All right, thanks again, Ken. 
Any other questions come in, Chris? Hey, Daniel. Yes, we have a couple of other questions. Here you go, Chris. I see you just, you're on. <laughs> Sorry, that yes. That, hard to find. I know, it just hides there. Okay, um, let's see. One of the questions is, how long is the process to get on GSA schedule these days? The timing is a huge roadblock for small businesses. Daniel, do you have any idea about how long it's taking? Yeah, I want to make sure. Am I muted? I'm Okay, we can hear you now. Yes. <laughs> okay, Same great. thing happened to you. Huh? Yeah, so so that's a great question. And really, there's just uh, so many factors that I can't just tell you uh, exactly how long a single offer is going to take. But if, if you are submitting an offer that has a known customer requirement and, and you have that customer contact us, that offer will get expedited. Um, again, we may have other offers also being expedited, but uh, we can pull in additional resources as needed to ensure that that offer um, gets to move through quickly so that we can meet those customers' needs, um, you know, depending on their funding requirements, et cetera, uh, any other milestones that they need to meet. Um, so there are a lot of different factors. I mean, uh, you know, our workload, the responsiveness of the vendor themselves, right? So, uh, you know, there has to go through the clarification process. Um, you know, that's once it gets through the initial screening to see that it's substantially complete. So there's there's a lot that goes into it. Um, we, you know, we're, we're always trying to uh, maintain our focus on offers so that we can drive down the cycle time. Apologize for that. Uh, but again, yeah, a lot of factors go into it. Um, you know, again, if you've got a known customer requirement and you convey that to the CEO that's assigned to the offer, um, depending on that requirement, then we're going to do everything we can to meet that customer's needs as far as getting that awarded so that they can get their requirement met on time. Okay, great. Um, one of the other ones, I'm, I'm not sure how we are on time, but they were asking about, um, they supply security system hardware and installation. And then how do I make sure I'm one of the three, three contractors end users include in their market research and quote requests? So I think they might be um, referring back to when I was talking about that chart on the requirement to only go to three, get RFQ quotes from three. Do you have anything to say to that, Daniel, that you'd like to add or? Um, well, so when a requirement is posted in eBuy, if you have that special item number that that requirement falls under, then it will be visible to you. So um, it's a good idea to go out and check eBuy to see any new postings. Uh, they can also select a contractor that they maybe know has that capability so that they'll also get an email. But if it's posted under the SIN that you've been awarded, then you'll have visibility and you can respond to that RFQ. Um, if they do it only by email, then um, then that's not something that we can control. But if it's above the SAT, then it, it should be posted on eBuy. However, FAR 8.4 allows them to do either eBuy or send it by email. Um, I've, I've brought up how I'm not happy about that. I think it should be both. Um, but as it stands right now, it can be emailed or posted to eBuy. And if it is posted to eBuy, you will have visibility to that requirement. Okay, and I'm just going to add something there, Kevin, that you asked that question about it. And if you would contact me, we do work with our vendors and we try and help them to find ways to be one of those three contractors that they contact. So um, if you'll find my email, chris.nespodomi at gsa.gov, reach out to me or if I can get your contact information, we could set up a time to discuss that. So I would be happy to do that. Okay, I think. Go ahead. Anne, I'm mm -hmm. sorry. Um, I just wanted to say we're actually good on time. So if you have a few more questions or if you have energy okay. to answer some questions, I know sometimes they can be very specific and require a little bit more research. But um, if you do have some additional questions, sure. just keep them going. Okay, well, we did have another one. It said, is there any guidance on or definition of what number of contractors is practical as it relates to procurements over the simplified acquisition threshold? And again, that was in that little chart that I was showing you. There is no definition of practicable, 
but what the understanding is is when it says you if you look on GSA Advantage and there are 10 contractors that offer what you're looking for if you don't post it on eBuy then you would want to send it out to all those 10 to have the best chance of getting a response to get exactly what you're needed and to look at what that best value is so if you don't post it on eBuy then I would look on Advantage and of the customers you know that can do it, send them an email requesting an RFQ. So that's what I would say on that. Um, let's see, we have another one. We had a GSA location that wanted us to do some work for 65000 I told them we had a GSA contract. They said we had to go out to bid unless we are an 8A contractor. I partnered with an 8A contractor to get the project. What could I say to explain to the GSA contracting officer? Well, I, without knowing all the details, and again, this is something that's probably specific and we would need to, you know, get all the information, but if they did have that particular um, acquisition set aside for an 8A, that would be why it didn't fall under just a GSA contract for a small business. But I'm not sure if I've answered that completely, but we will have your question here and make sure that we follow up with you. Okay. See, do we have anything else listed here? I think that might be it. So if we're ready to to move on. Okay. okay. I was make sure, Mary, you didn't have anything to say. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, thank you. That was great information. A lot of great questions were answered. And again, um, there will be a QA document circulated after this event where our subject matter experts will have time to really look into your questions, do some research and get those answers for you. Um, also, if you have not seen by now in the chat, uh, the slides are available for download for anyone who has any issues accessing the slides due to your technical abilities with your place of work. Um, and yeah, I'm gonna hand it over to Mary. Thank you, Tanika. Uh, again, just wanted to reinforce what Tanika just said. The slides are now posted at gsa.gov slash F-A-S-T. There you'll be able to see the slides for today. So I know some of you were having troubles with your systems to, to have the slides frozen or not being able to see them uh, if you weren't in the Zoom platform. So you can follow along with those now if you just visit us over there. It is my pleasure to introduce Mr. Stephen Bartley from GSA and Mr. Jason Craig from Dark Timber Kennels. This is not a picture of Mr. Craig or Mr. Bartley on your screen right now. This is an example of the fine canines that um, Mr. Craig has in his Dark Timber Kennels. Uh, Steve, I think you are going to take the floor here. If you wouldn't mind sharing your video, we can yeah, turn slides are, for you. If those needed. are actually uh, those are actually my dogs that came from Dark Trimmer Kennels. They and... are. They're beautiful. <laughs> my name is Stephen Bartley. I am the supervisory marketing specialist for the General Services Administration's Canine Program. Our canine contracts offer breeding training and equipment under the government-wide security and protection category. Dogs available include single and dual purpose, otherwise known as floppy or pointy-eared dogs. Breeds, our contracts offer multiple breeds such as the Belgian Malinois, the Belgian Taruvan, Dutch Shepherds, German Shepherds, Runnendale, and Labradors. Training, our contracts offer two basic types of training solutions, detection and apprehension. Equipment, since the equipment list is too broad, I won't get into those details other than to say we offer a broad variety of canine equipment. Something GSA likes to do in promoting our canine solutions is to invite special guests to help us better illustrate exactly what we mean when we say we offer canine solutions through our contracts. The best way we know to do that is to show you a canine in action. So let's meet Murray. Murray is a yellow lab and skilled as a single purpose floppy eared detection dog. 
Murray is working with Jason Craig from Dark Timber Kennels today. So Murray, show us how detection works. This is Murray, sit. And so what you're looking at here is you're looking at a dog that can turn off and turn on. So you're looking at a dog that's walking well, obedient, calm, and then when he needs to turn on, you tell him to search, his nose hits the ground, his nose hits the sidewall, and he understands the difference in the concept. Fear, you're looking for fear and sociability. So if the dog is afraid of doing something, afraid of climbing something, afraid of going in and out of something, then they're not gonna work. Yeah. Sit. Sit. So if you're going into Let's say a school here, or you're going into um, a parking lot, or, or wherever you're going into. Um, if you're going into a public area, you need a dog that's under control. But you also need a dog with a nose and is not afraid to get on something. Hup. Good. So no fear. Here. Good. No question. Doesn't care where I'm going to put him. He doesn't care where I'm going to ask him to go. He's just going to go do it. Ready? All right. Hunt him up. Good. Search. Good. Good. Hunt him up. Good. Search. Good. Search. Good. Good. Search. Good. Good job. Good. 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 Drop. Drop. Hup. Good. Search. Search, search, hey, hey, back. Here, here, good, good dog, good, good, drop, good, good, Hup. good, search, good, good dog. So a dog is not afraid to go into small spaces, high, low, that's exactly what you're looking for. Just basically Search. a dog with zero, zero issues. Good dog. Good dog. Good. So really what we're looking for when, when you're doing a young dog like Murray, Murray's still a young dog. Like he's just starting to become in his prime. What you're looking for a dog is that is focused. Now this dog can be anything we want him to be. He's a certified therapy dog. He's a hunting dog. He's an outfitter's dog. Um, I mean, he'll search anything we want in pretty much any pattern we want. And he's young, so he has a lot of learning to do. But if you're looking for a really high-end dog, like this is a really, really stellar example of what labs can do when they're trained correctly. And this is exactly what we're looking for. We're looking for dogs like Murray over and over again. Murray and Jason, thanks for your time and showing us what's involved with training a single purpose detection dog. You may note that I didn't say floppy eared again. That's because the pointy eared dogs can be trained for either single or dual purpose detection and apprehension. I'm not aware of any floppy ear dogs like Murray that have ever been trained for apprehension. However, they are strong and very capable. To conclude, GSA offers multiple breed options for whatever your end user requirements might be for canine security and protection. Our training includes single and or dual purpose detection and or apprehension. Our training also includes training the trainer. Green dogs are available. And as I mentioned earlier, we offer a broad variety of canine equipment. We appreciate your interest in our canine program and hope to hear from you soon. The flowchart on the screen is a view of our canine ordering guide. It is available as one of the acquisition planning package resources. For more information, please note our contact information on our final slide.
All right, thank you. That was very informative. Uh, thank you, Mr. Bartley, and thank you, Mr. Craig. I am going to see if we have any questions. Um, let's see, it looks like we have the contact information that's up on the screen as well. And if I'm looking correctly, I don't see any applicable questions at the moment. Um, so I can actually go right into the polls. Uh, let's see. Hold on a second. Uh, Tanika, questions. Oh, uh, I was gonna, yeah. Chris Ann, jump in there. Okay. Okay. Sure. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Well, I had someone had a question on what is a green dog. So. Go ahead, Jason. You want me to answer that? Okay. Sure. A green dog bait. So a green dog is going to have a few different characteristics, but the most important characteristic of a green dog is that they are able to do whatever search work needs to be done, but they're not put on any particular odor as of yet. So if you want to put a dog on a single odor or two or three different odors, this is a time in which the training that you would do that. Okay. Another one. What is the difference in a floppy eared dog or a pointed eared dog? The best and, uh, and most obvious analogy would be a Labrador retriever versus a uh, shepherd or Malinois. So you're going to have personality difference, uh, desire and temperament differences, but that's going to be the, the most obvious characteristic differences. Okay, and what about differences in detection, apprehension, or dual purpose dogs? So the majority of, I would say probably all, but let's say the majority of dual purpose dogs or apprehension dogs are not going to be floppy ear dogs. Uh, floppy ear dogs are not going to have the bite power or the aggressive nature in order to do that type of work. You can take a dog like a Malinois and a Shepherd and make them into a detection dog as well. And they do extremely well in that scenario. But there are many scenarios like airport schools, you know, uh, civilian friendly types of environments that the floppier dogs are going to do significantly better. Okay, let's see. We have another question about, I'm not sure if I'm saying this right, but do you ever use Raymond spectroscopy such as the tactic ID and companion to using the dogs? Uh, that is not something I have any knowledge of. Okay, me either. So, <laughs> but we will try and find something now. But as far as we know, that's not part of it. Um, there's another question. Is this dog training humane and approved by animal organizations? Everything that is done uh, as far as the training that we do, and I can only speak to us, is mostly done through uh, attrition and repetition. So you're not dealing with heavy-handed tactics. The dogs that are floppy-ear dogs that are doing the detection work, if you are harsh on their training, then they will not exceed in their training. So it's actually counterproductive. Okay. What about there's a, are there options for dogs trained using ball reward versus food reward? Uh, ball reward, in my opinion, is the only way that you would really have a truly successful dog over time. If they do not have the ball drive, then they will not have um, the the training that's built into their DNA to move forward. You only do it for food when they're not hungry, you're not going to get the same results. Where a dog who will always chase a ball will always want to work. That makes sense. What is your opinion on training dogs to detect COVID? I think you can train them to do anything you want. They're doing it for cancer. They, they're already doing some dogs for COVID. Um, there should be zero issue with that whatsoever. Okay. How old is too old or how young or how old is too old? How young is too young when thinking about training? Um, uh, so we're, we're, are we talking about the procurement aspect of it or the starting of the training? It's going to make a difference. I'll, I'll just, just, let's answer just go the with one. the starting of the training. Sure. Okay. 
So if you're looking to start a dog in training, generally speaking, under a year old is preferable. The earlier, the better. We start our dogs at six weeks old. Uh, if you go much older than a year old, then for the most part, the personality is completely formed. And you're going to get a lot less compliance out of the dog because they've already formulated their own opinions on what they want to do and what they don't want to do. Okay. All right. Here's another one on issues with dog brokers and fallout rate versus trainers. Okay. Um, that's a that's a long question. I'll try to give you a short answer okay. of it. So what what we personally feel is the reason why the fallout rate is so high uh, is simply because the people who are presenting the dogs for the testing are only prepping the dog for that particular test. So if you want to learn a specific task and that's all you do is pr practice that task over and over again, you'll be highly successful at it. However, when you actually have to go to put that task into regular training mode or, or you have to get into a new situation, the dog does not have the tools in place. A trainer will not train specifically for that test where a broker will run that test over and over and over again directly before they actually go have the dog evaluated. And so that's why I believe you're having such a, a, a large fallout rate. Mm. Okay. Let's see. There seems like there's just a couple more here. Um, a question about fitting the right temperament of dog to the handler. Can you speak to that? Correct. We've seen a lot of issues with trainers, uh, handlers that are used to a specific breed of dog. So it, it's more difficult to take somebody who is doing or has a lot of experience with, let's say, a Malinois, and you switch them over to a young Labrador retriever, you're not going to get the same temperament. So if the trainer is not aware of that and cannot um, convey to the dog what they're looking for, you're going to have a lot more issues. And you're going to have the exact same issues in reverse if you switch over somebody who's used to dealing a floppy ear dog and then you give them just a really high energy Malinois, you're going to have uh, similar issues as well. So if you are honest with yourself about what kind of dog best fits you, you'll have a significantly higher chance of having a successful dog team. Excellent questions here. Let's see. Um, another one, uh, procurement of dogs based on need versus availability. What are your thoughts on that? If you don't have dogs that are ready to go, when you need them, they're not going to be there. If you start before the breeding process ever starts, you're talking 18 months to two years before your dog's ready to hit the field. So you have a huge lag in between the time when you actually need a dog and when you're going to have the dogs available. And we've seen this before with IED dogs and different types of detection dogs. There was a huge lag in the very beginning before they were actually able to catch up with the need um, versus the availability. Okay. Man, these are great. So do we have any other questions? I think those were the main ones I see here. Um, I'd had a question. I just want to know what's Murray doing now? <laughs> Murray is actually a um, semi-retired stud dog. And <laughs> so he is um, living the life and doing pretty much whatever he wants. And so He's a few years old now, and he's uh, proven to be not only a good a good partner, but he's also proven to be a good stud dog. So that doesn't always happen, and with Murray, it did. It was a it was a really nice dog, great cross. He is able to do virtually anything that we want him to do, and he's able to go to work pretty much at the drop of a hat. <laughs> There's How another many one. Can we count on for Murray? I'm sorry. Say again. How many litters can we count on for Murray? I believe we have 34 breedings left in uh, in Frozen, so that should be all we have. Someone typed in here, the smartest dog. Is that one? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, it has been wonderful seeing how all that works. And, and just to think that he's not even, you know, a fully trained dog when we were watching him in that video. Because you said he's he was pretty young at that point, correct? Yeah, he was, and, he was still a puppy and still learning. and. You know, in a video, we're only able to show bits and pieces of really what he can do and what he can't do. 
uh, just just simply because of the way that the videos work. But he has and always has exhibited the the best characteristics of a working dog. Great personality, great with children, great with other dogs, no other behavioral issues, and he could turn on the work when he wanted. He could turn it off when he wanted. And that really, truly is what makes the floppy-eared dogs different than uh, the pointy-eared dogs. Oh, well, this has been just wonderful. Thank you so much, Jason. And, and let Marie know we appreciate it, too. Will do. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> All right, thanks. All right. Thank you. Those are a lot of questions that were answered. Um, floppy ear versus pointy ear dog. So learn something new every day. Uh, that was a wonderful uh, session there. Um, so we're actually going to get to the poll now. <laughs> and yeah, so I'm going to pull the IT. Sorry for the sound problem. We were, this is a plan B uh, video backup. We could not work out the live demo arrangement for you. So we had plan B ready to go. So I hope everybody could hear it and you'll certainly get access to it when mm -hmm. we send out the follow up. Correct. Yes, we'll have the video recordings of the session as a follow up as well. Okay, so we're going to get into a poll question here. And it's about, let's see, security services needs. Okay, I'm going to launch it. And do you need security services in? And so you answer one of the following questions. One location, multiple locations, a remote location, or more than one state. All right, I'm going to end the poll and share the results. And it looks like half of the respondents said multiple locations, more than one state. Okay, let's stop sharing the results there. And I'm going to hand it over to you, Mary. Thanks, Tanika. Um, appreciate that session on the canines. Um, we next up, we have Mr. Daniel Stafford, Mr. Jared Bush, and Mr. Ken Miller again to present on GSA's solution to security services, but they're going to present some case study examples. So this is real life, things that have happened in their experience. Um, we hope you can see yourself in there and please do uh, go to the q and If you've got any questions that spurs your thinking today, you've got the subject matter experts right there in front of you. Daniel, Jared, and Ken, the floor is yours. All right, thank you, Mary. Uh, so case studies, I'm gonna talk about one of my case studies. I like to call it a success story. Um, in this, uh, on the next slide, this has to do with the, the summer, uh, late summer 2017. If you remember, category five, Hurricane Maria was doing all kinds of damage, destruction in the Northeast Caribbean. Um, I got a call from a customer asking if we had on-call guards on any of our contracts. Um, and I said, well, we, we don't pay guards unless they show up. Uh, what do you need? Uh, they said, well, we need guards that are able to respond within two hours. And I said, well, let me contact my vendors and, and see if anybody can meet that requirement. Um, so worked with some of my team, CO teams here. We reached out to some vendors, um, came up with the name On Demand Guards, and we were able to get those added to their contracts um, to, to support that customer. Um, of course, it's going to include a premium because uh, for that readiness that they're maintaining, uh, when they did show up um, within the two hours to protect life and property uh, and maintain order in Puerto Rico, um, they were able to meet that customer's requirements. So, um, you know, it's different when you have a scheduled guard versus an on-demand guard. Again, we wrote this in via the modification process using SF30 for this effort uh, in response to Maria. So the customer was able to um, get their guards as needed when they required them uh, because there really was uh, no, uh, it was unknown when they were going to need them and where. So uh, we got those written into the contracts and the vendors were able to support that requirement. Uh, and, and again, it's a win-win uh, for the customer, the vendor, and GSA. Uh, so that's my case study. And uh, if Ken's ready, I'll turn it over to him. He's going to talk more about that Marshall Service BPA. 
Thank you again, Daniel. Uh, although labeled case studies, I'd just like to take the time to share uh, some experiences, some lessons learned we encountered while putting together our BPA for Detention Officer Services in support of the United States Marshal Service mission with hope that it'll provide some insight while you gather your own requirements. Uh, utilizing the law enforcement schedule, we awarded a BPA for Detention Officer Services uh, to the Marshal Service or for the Marshal Service for prisoner operations and transportation to include overseeing uh, the detention management matters for individuals remanded to Marshal Service custody, also providing safe and secure housing, medical care and transportation for federal prisoners throughout the United States and providing coordination, scheduling and security handling of prisoners in federal custody and transporting them to detention facilities, courts and correctional institutions. So the first uh, thing I wanna to talk to you about is onboarding and offboarding. We awarded a multiple award BPA to six vendors to satisfy the marshal service requirements. As the call orders were solicited, we noticed that not all uh, BPA call holders were participating or submitting quotes in response to our solicitation. In hindsight, uh, it would have been helpful to include language to onboard and off offboard uh, the BPA contractors to allow the, or to ensure healthy and robust competition among our call orders. You may investigate uh, and consider this while putting your own requirement together. The next is uh, guard services licensing can be a requirement. If you wanna ensure contractors are licensed in the state that they're providing services in, you may request this at the order level. Just please remember licensing varies by state and county. And in some states, no licensing requirements exist at all. But you wanna check with your specific state to find out what their licensing requirements are. Also, each Service Contract Act wage determination is incorporated at the contract level. However, I would recommend that you cite the specific wage determination in your individual task order so it's clear which wage determination is applicable to your individual requirement. This ensures the contractors paying the correct rates called out by the Service Contract Act for the area or areas covered by your contract and or task order. You also want to plan for the unexpected and capitalize on what's known. As you're all aware, we, no one foresaw COVID-19, but it had real effects on our Marshal Services BPA. As a result of COVID, we had to add additional BPA requirements like infectious disease plans, and we utilized the OLM clan to reimburse the contractor for personal protective equipment required by garden detainees. As a foot stomp to using the schedules, being able to add that order level material clan proved to be invaluable as it provided a means for contractors to continue to provide services in uncertain conditions. Also, we learned uh, that there were some continuing resolution problems that we encountered. Uh, there was no budget passed. And so we had to add language in our BPA that defined mission essential services and instructed our contractors on when and how to operate during these times when funding was uncertain. As I mentioned earlier, you wanna avoid vague language and be clear about what you expect from each labor category under your contract. In our BPA, there was a requirement for the contractor to provide prison transport vehicles. It was assumed that the transport vehicles were on the contractor's schedules or that the contractors had a way of leasing the vehicles. And we found out what we normally find out when we assume. Uh, not only did some of the contractors not have the vehicles on their schedule, some entered into leases, which we anticipated, but some contractors actually purchased vehicles and wanted to be a reimbursed uh, by the government for their vehicle purchases. Again, because we didn't have clear language in our PWS, in some cases, we had to pay for those vehicles. Be intentional about your contract language. To that same effect, we had a project manager and a detention officer labor category on our BPA. At one point, the contractor provided a project manager who was also qualified as a detention officer and attempted to have that individual on shift be paid as both the supervisor and the detention officer simultaneously. Please make sure your expectations are clear 
as to how you want your contract vehicle to operate. And last but not least, use those SCA labor categories. Our marshal service customer called their labor category a correction slash detention officer or CDO. The SCA lists these as two separate and distinct labor categories, correction officer and detention officer with two different rates of pay. So be careful to only utilize the applicable SCA labor categories. Again, it was my hope to provide some realistic information that you may be able to utilize to strengthen your particular acquisition. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to share and back to you, Daniel. All right, thanks, Ken. Uh, do we have any questions that have come in for these case studies? Again, I just want to point out, I think it's really highlighting the flexibility and responsiveness of using schedule uh, via the, the OLM SIN and the SF30 or modification process uh, shows how responsive we're able to be to our customers. Well, uh, Daniel and Ken, I don't see any questions right now on that, but I think it's always wonderful to be able to hear other people's issues and hopefully learn from that and incorporate that into what you're doing. So you don't have to recreate that or recreate that experience. So uh, love that information that's shared. And again, if anyone does have questions, you know, please let us know. Let's see. Um, okay, we do have one. Do you have services similar for 911 operators? So that's a good one. Um, and, and that does seem like it would be in the security protection category. Right now we don't, but I would think uh, that's uh, state and local mostly. And um, certainly if they came to us, I'm, I'm sure we would be glad to, uh, you know, use the RFI process or uh, work with case to find vendors who can meet that need. But as of right now, I'm not aware that we support that, um, but it's certainly something that we'd be interested in uh, if the need is there. Yes, very good point. If this applies to everything and not just, you know, guard services, but if there are things that you need as a customer and you're seeing that there's missing areas, please let us know so we can go out to vendors and talk to them about getting onto the GSA schedule contract program and making it available because if you're needing it, there's probably a good chance that another federal agency needs the same thing. So yeah, just let us know. We would appreciate the feedback. Any other questions for me or Kim? It does not look like there are any more questions, Daniel. Um, we are uh, a bit ahead right now. So uh, I will go ahead and turn it over to Tanika. I think she has some knowledge checks and some polls. Yes, I do. Thank you. And thank you for those great case studies. Uh, so let's get started here. So the first one is actually a knowledge check on wage determinations. I'm gonna launch it here. All right, where are wage determinations incorporated? Schedule contract level, task order level, or RFQ? All right, and we are at 20 seconds. I'm gonna share the results. So if you are in that 45% of schedule contract level, you are correct. That is the correct answer. Uh, wage determinations are incorporated in the schedule contract level. Okay, that was a knowledge check. So we are going to do our next poll question. Okay, uh, and this one is on task order pricing. I'm gonna launch it here. What is the biggest determinant of task order pricing? Is it location, customer, or time of year? This is your answer. So this is not an dollars check, this is just a poll. We wanna see what the responses are. Okay. All 
right? It gave you three extra seconds. <laughs> so uh, it looks like over 70% said location, 20% said customer, and 7% said time of year when it comes to the biggest determinant of task order pricing. Sorry, I need to show it here. Okay. All right, and I'm gonna hand it back over to you, Mary. Okay. Thank you everyone for staying engaged on those knowledge checks and polls. Um, it's great information for us to know what's important to you as we build out more of these types of conferences. We hope that you are enjoying the conference so far, um, but we're sure that everyone is ready for a break. We are just a couple of minutes ahead of schedule. So we're gonna let you have an additional five minutes. So we'll see you back here in about 15 minutes, which it is 2.36 right now. So that would mean that you would be back at 2.51. So enjoy your break and we will see you back at 2.51. Just doing a sound check here. Can you hear this? Can anyone hear this? Yes, Lars, we can hear you. Thank you. That means Thank you for here. the test. Thanks. Thank you. Appreciate it.
Just three short minutes to go, folks. So grab those last minute drinks, snacks, whatever, and we'll get started in just three minutes. Welcome back. I hope you all had a great break. Next up, we have a 15 minute micro session for you on physical access and control systems. We have Mr. Lars Suniborn, and he is the senior consultant from ID Technology Partners, along with Mr. Stephen Bartley from GSA to tell you about this. Take it away, Lars and Steve. Thank you so much. I am pleased to be here today and talk to you about some of these things. And uh, what we will cover here is uh, a little bit of what we are moving away from in the world of fiscal access control system, what we're moving to, and some of the changes that have uh, affected the system and the factors and, and the procurement processes here. And am I in control of the slides or do you change this? You can Next go slide. ahead and share your screen, Lars. I have your screen on, on, uh, on here now. So if you will, please go to the next slide. Okay, we've got it for you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So in the, uh, in the old days, the so-called legacy systems that have been common for many, many years, uh, manufacturers relied on system manufacturers, worked together with card manufacturers, 
and the card manufacturer produced cards that were proprietary for each site and, and often for every system that was installed there too. And um, the card manufacturers maintained a list of numbers that were used on the cards that was issued to the people. You, you remember you have a scene access control system, you get a card, you wave it in front of a card reader and the card reader reads a number of that card. And the card manufacturers worked with the system manufacturers and they had a proprietary format and the system would read the number of these cards. And then the access control system had policies that were programmed in there that would grant access to the people presenting the card. And that would be based on time of the week, day, time of the day, specific area, and why do the people need in there? And perhaps other specific policies that was in there. And being that it was proprietary, that was done and they maintained a list of these proprietary numbers and they maintained a list of this so that they can make sure that they didn't issue duplicate card numbers in the same geographical area, at least not too many times. As it turned out, they ran out of these numbers so some duplications became uh, common away. So those are some of the issues that, uh, that was uh, common in the access control system world before PIV and the PIVI compliance system come. Next slide, please. So what we have here now is a uh, GSA APL tax. So General Service Administration stood up a, a program where they can approve products and put those approved product in a list. And that has complicated a little bit on, on uh, the system manufacturers, how they make systems. Uh, it has also changed how the systems are ordered and they changed a little bit on the composition of, of, these, uh, of these systems and uh, how they're deployed and how they're engineered. So you have now a access control system that has, that has in addition to the, to the normal infrastructure with the controllers and the servers and the databases and everything, that, everything else that we have sold and bought for decades, they now also are equipped with readers that are appropriate for each protected area. And there are different requirements for these areas and the different requirements for the readers that let people into these areas. And then we also have to have now a method to authenticate the card. This is something that did not exist in the past. So the readers of the system must now make sure that the card is authentic. That means that it comes from a trusted source, that a good card has not been altered, and that a, uh, the card has not been copied or been forged. And then there's, of course, services that goes with this here too. Next slide, please. And when, when your contracting officer and the contracting officers get a request to purchase an access control system for an agency at some location, we cannot expect that the contracting officer will know how many readers there are and what the different areas are that are going to be protected. That needs to come from the buying agency that needs to come from the security specialist of the agency that is ordering the system. And what you should ask them for is for the security classifications of the areas that they are buying the protection for, what they're buying the equipment for. And NIST and GSA has worked together to come up with a standardized security classification. And that will then result in you knowing what number, how many readers for each type of area that is going to be part of this, uh, this acquisition. Next slide, please. And those areas are, are referred to as uh, controlled area. And that needs to have authentication of something you have. That means the card is authenticated. That is referred to as one factor authentication. Another area that is a little bit more stringent, you have a little bit more higher value target in here. That's a limited area. Now we need to authenticate both the card, something we have, and something you know, that makes sure then we have a reasonable level of assurance that the card is in the hands of the person to whom it was issued, and that is card and a pin. So that's called two-factor authentication. And in the most secure areas, the most sensitive areas, that will be called an exclusion area under the NIST, under the NIST classification here. And then we have to have something that we have, the coordinates must be authenticated. We have something that we know that must be authenticated, the PIN, and something we are, a biometric. And then we can be, have a very high level of assurance 
that the card that is being presented to this to the system is indeed in the hands of the correct person. Next slide, please. And here is a typical example. To assist with this, there is something that is called the PAX ordering guide. And there's an example facility in here, an example facility that helps, that helps to both the buying organization as well as the contracting, the procurement officer uh, uh, with this process. And it has here then a result of what comes back from the security specialist of the ordering agency. So you see here then in this fictitious building, there are a couple of entrances with one factor readers going into the green area. There is a reader going into a limited area, two factor card and pin. And then we have, we have a more sensitive area here, perhaps an IT or a data center that is three factor authentication. So that gives us a reader count for this particular site, for this particular procurement. And that, as I said, must come from the ordering agency, the security specialist. Next slide, please. And GSA and NIST, they have created what is called a FIPS 201 evaluation program. And that is what uh, I just mentioned here a little bit earlier. And the system manufacturers that is on this approved product list, it is a handful of system. I'm I am today at the uh, International Security Conference, the, the conference here in Las Vegas. And there are, the show is smaller here this year due to the COVID, but there are traditionally about 100, 140 different manufacturers of access control equipment. And of those, there are a dozen or so, 10, 15 manufacturers that have managed to get their equipment through the GSA FIPS 201 evaluation program and have their systems on the so-called APL, the GSA APL. And this is a screenshot from an earlier version of the APL. I am aware that this is an earlier version, but for the purpose of this session, this particular early version is exactly what I wanna show. It has all the information on the same slide. And we have here what, we, what I referred to a little bit earlier, the PAX infrastructure. Now, what is the PAX infrastructure? That is one of the product categories. PAX infrastructure is the traditional access control system that we have been buying and selling for decades. That is the server with the application, the application database, and some field equipment controllers, et cetera, et cetera. So that is one product category. And as you see here uh, in the center column, PAX infrastructure, and just immediately to that, to the right of that, is a column with some numbers. That is an approved list number, an APL number. This is important. The new APL list had the same information, but you must click through different screens to get it. Whereas the older one here that I show for this purpose, everything is in, in the same screen. So you have a manufacturer, you have a product category, and then you have an APL number. And then there's something that is called a validation system, an authentication system. And that is something that is added onto the traditional PAX infrastructure. And that is the certificate of card validation system. And that is the component that ensures that the card is indeed originated from a trusted source. We know who made it. We know that it has not been copied. We know that it has not been forged. And we can then tell that a good card has not been altered to try to spoof the system to bring advanced access to this. And then you have readers for one factor authentication. We have readers for two factor authentication and three factor authentication. So the three product categories are tax infrastructure, certificate validation, and readers. Next slide, please. And here again, tax infrastructure and number of readers to the green area, controlled area, numbers of readers to enter the limited area, the yellow area, and the number of readers to enter the exclusion area. These are information that you must get from the ordering agency. And then we have the card authentication, card validation system. Okay, next slide, please. And of this uh, PAX customer ordering guide, uh, as I said, there is a fictitious example of a scope of work with a fictitious facility. It is a real scope of work that includes video and other things that you may or may not need. But this is the list here. There's a spreadsheet here. And this is the one that is really important. And this is the one that is helpful for you. 
And as you see here, there is equipment here that talks about tax infrastructure in the left column. That's the main product category. You're very likely going to need one of those because that is the, the access control system, the fiscal access control system. You're likely going to need one of those. And as you see, these numbers are filled out here in this column with red. Red numbers mean that is something that you will, will, will submit. You will populate these data center, these data objects in the information that you sent out to industry when you're looking for a quote or for information or an RFP or an RFQ, whatever it might be. So the red numbers here, this is something that you as a contracting officer or, or a procurement officer sent out to industry. And you see here, there's one quantity for PAX infrastructure. And then there is X number of reader to a controlled area. And then there is X number of reader to a limited area and X number of reader to an exclusion area. But the certification system, that particular cell block is empty. That is not populated. Why is that empty? Well, there are different validation systems out there. And each one of those supports X number of readers. There is a certificate validation system there that supports one reader each. There is a common system validate, a certificate validation system that supports two readers each. There are some that supports eight readers. There are some that supports 10 readers. And there are a few that support 16 readers each. So this is something that you cannot know. That is something that is populated by the vendor that you send this to. And that is based on the equipment that they represent and that they are subject, that they are including in their quote and send back to you. So summary here, the red, the red numbers is part of your outgoing information request. And when it comes back to you, then that should be populated. And if you take a look at that, next slide, please. So this is what comes back. Here you see a mixture of what comes back. Tax infrastructure, it has an ABC security products, miracle system, fictitious name, with an APL number. That means that this vendor that has filled in the, the, all the information with blue, they have looked at the, the GSA APL and they have selected this system with this approval number, the 6701 in this example, and then a price. And then you have the certificate validation system with an approval number and quality one. That means that this particular brand of certificate validation system can handle all the reader for this particular site. And then we have X number of readers to a controlled area, the green area, X number of readers to the limited area, the yellow area, and X number of reader to the exclusion area. Next slide, please. And once you have this, this uh, system, these components in there, then it is also important that you have people that understand the differences and what they are supposed to do with it. And so you have a list of certified people, and here you have a list of certified, certified people and a list of certified equipment. So here you have here pretty much the same thing, a, a name of a person, the company that they're with, and how long the certification is good. And that is called Certified System Engineering, ICAM PACS. That is the CSAP certification. Next slide, please. And here you have the, uh, the uh, name and the title of the different people and the, the date when it expires. So then that means that the technical evaluation team and the contacting officers that can confirm the proposed equipment and staff with an ID management of the website, because both the equipment, the APL, the approved product list, and the people are, are posted on the ID management of the website. Next slide, please. And then you have some labor categories, labor category for CSCIP services, system engineering and documentation. And uh, you have here the CSCIP expiration date and perhaps what the persons are and categories for system design and hours and system configuration, labeling and drawing and preventive maintenance and updates and so on and so forth. And this is just an example of some of the labor categories that might be in here. And it gives you here an example of how many hours or how many times, what, what number of hours are, are, uh, are appropriate for this. Next slide, please. And uh, all this has uh, certain uh, identification, so certain special item numbers. 
and you have for components and you have for services, some SIN numbers that are here. So using this, using this, the uh, PAX customer and ordering guide that is posted on another site, so the ID management.gov, the gsa.gov, using the, the proper equipment that has been designed and engineered by the right people, that gives you an assurance that you're doing it right the first time. Next slide, please. Questions? Wow, that is awesome, Lars. Thank you so much. You have a way of making that what seems like a very complicated process sound okay. We can do that. There is a there's a there's a way to get to that information that we need. And yes, we do have a, you know a couple questions came up. Um, one question was: Is training on the packs included, or is that a separate order? That. Is Training for the access control system by the uh, by the system engineering people that are. I would to... imagine, like, will they explain to you how to use it or get it set up? Right. So the uh, the service providers, the system integrators, their people are supposed to have the certification before they even submit a bid, and so and before they get into into the into the site and start doing the engineering of the of the systems themselves, and that is something that is part of the cost of doing business actually. Okay, another one, I've never seen an APL number requirement. Is that a newer requirement? If not requested, should we include it anyway? And absolutely, that is your assurance that the equipment indeed have been passed. The very, very stringent and very elaborate testing process that GSA has, has stood up. It is a significant difference between a legacy system and one of the systems that have passed the, uh, the APL program and the, the, the testing and evaluation program. Okay. Well, here's another one. Does my agency have to follow FICAM and OMB policies? Yes. Uh, HSPD 12, Homeland Security Presidential Directive 12, mandates all executive branches must follow this, uh, this requirement. And uh, all the executive branches, that is, of course, them, the big one, the, the Department of Defense, uh, the Department of Commerce, the Department of Homeland Security, et cetera, et cetera. The only branches that are exempted from here is the legislative branch, the Senate and the House, and uh, the, judicial, the judicial branch. Uh, part of that is, um, we have part of that, the judicial, the judicial branch is the FBI. And they said that we're a part of the intelligence community. We already have a secure credential uh, as part of it. But the answer is all executive branch agencies must comply with this. Okay, thank you. We already have we already have readers that are reading the PIV cards on our location. Are we okay? Oh, well, this is one that is that is unfortunately common. It is very deceptive because it is. It is often, too often, that the agencies and even system integrators that do not understand fully what they're supposed to do. They come from the legacy type system. When you present the card to a reader, they read it and, and read some data off that card, a number of that card, and send it in. And you can certainly present a PIV or a DOD CAC card to a reader and just grab some number on it. But that number is exposed. That number that is used is visible. That's called the card identifier. And unless we have the certificate validation to prove, the system can prove that the card comes from a known trusted source. That can prove that the card has not been altered or copied or modified. Then we are actually lowering the security of that card as compared to the old legacy stuff. So it is very deceptive. But my point here is that if it has not been authenticated and validated correctly, there is less security at the site than it even with an old type legacy system. So it might seem that everything is done right, but unless the certificate validation component is in there, it is going to be, uh, it's almost like you're paving a highway right through the lobby of that building. <laughs> and that doesn't sound like a good thing. <laughs> no, it's not a good thing. <laughs> okay. <don't> <laughs> 
Uh, so um, I have another follow up. Uh, Kevin had asked the question of four about the APL number requirement. And then he asked if it is listed on our GSA schedule, is that sufficient? It should be matched with, with, a, uh, with a product category. So if you have a PAX infrastructure component or a certificate validation system infrastructure component and an APL, and it is also matched. So just because you have a PAX that is on the, on the APL list with an APL number, it must be integrated as an end-to-end -end system and that has proven that this chain of components work together and in, in a secure end-to-end -end fashion so that we cannot just take well, one component that has an APL number and a different component that has an APL number. It must have been tested in a sequence in one combination as one whole system. So yes, I would say it must be an APL number associated with there. That's your proof that the system actually has passed the test and that test shows what other APL numbers have, it has been tested with. So it is a suite of these numbers that needs to be part of your, your uh, responses. And that's something that your technical evaluation team should look for. That makes sense. Okay, Ruben had a question. How can we speak with existing EPAC system users to validate the system can do what the vendor manufacturer has said it can do. For example, system integrations with CCTV. That is actually uh, a little bit that's out of scope for what this uh, the APL program does. Uh, I would say that comes okay. down to the system integrators for them to evaluate the integration tools that are provided by the different system manufacturers. Uh, that is actually a pretty important component and a very good question. Um, you can have the best of breed of an access control system, and you can have the best of breed of a video system. But if the integration tools between the two do not expose the system functions that you need, then you're still not going to have a system that operates as what you would like it to do. So that is a little bit out of scope. For, for the for the FIPS 201 evaluation program, it goes back to the traditional question. You have a system integrated that you can trust. Okay, All right. Um, we are seeing significant pushback in regards to cost to create end-to-end -end integrated secure PIV class with PAM. How do we impress on end users the need to fully fund true security compliance? Yeah, uh, unfortunately, cost when compared to the legacy equipment is significantly higher. It, 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 it has increased. Uh, I would think that what would be the cost to the agency, both in, in reputation and perhaps damage, if there's a security breach? I, I think that's the way that I would to put it back. Okay. Then we have a, someone asked again, and I, <laughs> you've gone over it, but how do we know what equipment to buy? I would, I would uh, go and look at the GSA ID management.gov, look at that GSA approved product list. It is listed there in a, in a very nice fashion. The list that I showed you here is an old screenshot. Uh, the, new sc the new list says, if you have this PAX infrastructure, then you can use this validation system with these readers. So it is listed in a nice organized manner. It's just that you have to dig into each one of them to find the actual APL number. And then go to the APL list, go to the gsa.com or .gov APL. Christian, I'm sure in the next segment, we'll have uh, Roy from Systems Engineering happy to answer that question. Okay, well, you did right the first time, and and, and uh, I happen to know uh, that company, and uh, that's one that you can trust. You did right the first time; they do it right the first time. Oh, that's awesome. Okay, well, I don't see any more questions coming in right at this time. Um, I think that okay going once. All right, Lars, thank you so very much. You have, a, like I said, a great way of presenting that can be complicated um, 
type of procurement. So you have a nice way to streamline it and that ordering mm -hmm. guide, yeah. you know, is Thank invaluable. You. I think one of the um, one of the best compliments we heard about this was that um, our contractors are able to tell from the customer if they have used that ordering guide or not because it comes in so much cleaner and clearer that they know you know that they have really gone through and, and taken a look at that so thank you thank you and if if you have any questions on this please feel free to reach out to me you have both my email there and the, and the phone number i'd be glad to help you out with any questions you may have along the way thank you so much for letting me be part of this excellent program Great, thank you. Thank you, Lars, and thank you, Chris Ann, for facilitating the Q&A for that session. Um, so we have time for our last poll. <laughs> so before we get into the panel discussion, I'm going to pull up a poll here. One second. And this is in regards to the HSPD-12. Do you know whether your physical access control system is compliant with the specs FIPS 2012 derived from HSPD 12. And let me launch that question. That's a yes or no question. All right. I'm in the poll and 20 seconds in. So almost 50-50, uh, so 40% said yes, 60% said no. And um, without further ado, I'll hand it over to Mary so she can get the next session started. Thank you, Tanika. Wow, great session, Lars. And we're moving on to yet another session where we're going to have some great discussion with some people who have knowledge about many of the security and protection solutions. So I'd like to welcome a combined panel of GSA staff and industry partners to discuss questions around security and protection. That includes guard services, armored vehicles, canines, and the physical access and control PACS system that you had just heard about. Moderating this discussion will be the one and only, very helpful, Chris Ann Neswadomi. Panel, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much, Mary. Okay, well, yes, we are very excited to have with us today some of our industry partners that have been um, you know, so, so agreeable to come and join us. Earlier, we did hear from Jason Craig with Dark Timber Kennels, and you just heard from Lars, and we do have from CSI Armoring, Oz Bashir and Michael Brown. And before we get started, you know, asking questions, I want to let each of these um, industry partners introduce themselves, just a, a quick little intro on, on who you are. So CSI Armoring, if you would like to start it off. Um, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for having us. Uh, this is an amazing uh, setup here. I'm really impressed. Uh, great job, everybody. Uh, to let you uh, guys in on uh, what CSI Armoring was, uh, we were incorporated in Florida uh, in the year 2004, and we've had a uh, successful GSA contract running on year 16. Very proud of it. Um, we build armored vehicles for the government, um, law enforcement agencies, done a lot of work with uh, CENTCOM, Tank and Army Command, uh, Department of State, uh, Department of Justice. Uh, there's there's no platform out there that hopefully we cannot armor. And um, uh, we've, we've had a lot of success uh, securing business through GSA. Um, we're located out here in North Carolina. Uh, welcome. And uh, this has been my what second time podcast, as I mentioned yesterday. So, <laughs> talking about yeah. capabilities, <clears throat> where our headquarter building is about sixty five hundred square foot uh, fabrication facilities, mm -hmm. about twenty eight thousand square foot. We have our own independent body shop. Uh, final assembly building is fifteen thousand square foot. Our parts warehouse is about ten thousand mm -hmm. square foot. 
uh, machine shop is 25,000 square foot. And uh, we're, we're one of the leading uh, industry providers that uh, defeat, I would say, uh, 50 cal AP at a 25 foot distance. That means a lot in, in our industry. So great. That's okay. A, that's a short brief. <laughs> well, was uh, Michael able to join us? Yes. Uh, Mike, are you in? Yes, I'm here. Can you okay. hear me? Yes, we can. Maybe you can give us just a, a quick intro. Uh, sure, sure. Mike Brown, uh, work with Oz, primarily uh, managing business development outside of GSA. So I'm relatively new to the process here and, um, and do a lot of operational work as well and, and look forward to learning more about the GSA system and, and how we can expand our capabilities, which we're looking to do. Um, and look forward to uh, panel discussion and, and, uh, and getting through questions in, in more detail. Awesome. Okay. Also with us today from Systems Engineering is Roy Hayes. Royce, could you, Roy, could you give us a little information about you and your company? Hi, I'm Roy Hayes. I'm President of Systems Engineering. We're a system integration firm primarily focusing on security systems and information systems. Uh, we have about 1,500 uh, square foot demonstration laboratory where we integrate um, all the major PAC systems to situational awareness systems, uh, PCIF systems, physical security information management systems to provide situational awareness. Um, thank you for having me. I look forward to answering any questions. Thank you so much for joining us. And next, top notch security, we have Alfred Washington and Hope Edge. If you guys could go ahead and say a few words and introduce yourselves. Great. Um, Hope Edge here. I don't know if, anyone, if you can see me. We can. Okay, great. Um, Hope Edge, um, I am the VP of Business Development with Top Notch Security. We are a full-fledged armed and unarmed security firm founded in 1999, based in Memphis, Tennessee. Um, we really view our clients as long-term partners, and we have experience providing unarmed and armed security physically for several different agencies over the years. Um, uh, really, our core competency is trying to leverage the latest technology to make sure that our partners are able to um, integrate our services into their operation. Um, we're GSA service contract holder, and we were just happy to have the opportunity to answer any questions out there in industry and uh, provide any insight. Excellent. Well, again, thank you guys so much for joining. And then we also have on our contracting side, the subject matter experts in this field, Daniel Stafford, who has been presenting to us throughout today. And then also I believe Jared Bush will be joining us. Are you guys on? Hey, Chris. Yes, this is Daniel. I'm here and um, hey, not positive about Jared. Um, you there, Jared? Hey, I'm here. Can you hear me? Can you guys see me? Uh, I can hear you. Can you hear you? <laughs> there okay, we go. there he's coming up. All right. Excellent. Okay, well, we do have some questions that you know we wanted to ask, but we would love to have you guys participate in doing that Q&A so we can have, you know, it's one of those rare opportunities when we can have a group of people together like this to answer anything that you might, you know, have on your mind that might be coming up as a procurement. So please don't hesitate to put those questions in there. But we will go ahead and get started. And I think one of the first ones that had come up, and I'm going to send that to you, Roy, is can you say or tell us what PAX is? So PAX simply is an acronym for Physical Access Control System. Uh, PAX grants access to employees or contractors uh, when they visit a, a, a um, site. They electronically authenticate their PIV credentials. Um, basically, a PAX is an information system, but it must be designed and deployed and operated in cooperation with the physical security team in order to meet the agency requirements. Okay, so does that so good just have that playing field? We, we throw acronyms around and sometimes it just need to clarify for everyone what that is. Um, there was another question that had come up about what effect, if any, does the January 6th events have on PACs? Have you seen that? Yes. Um, 
unfortunately, according to the Brooklyn Institute, uh, the events that happened at the U.S. Capitol was basically a glaring collapse of the U.S. government security uh, in an act of what some people consider terror. Physical and operational security policies failed to protect the federal facility. What that indicated is a need uh, to integrate policies, implement strategies that detect, delay, and deter any potential threat or an aggressor from a federal facility or any facility for that matter that's being protected. So in short, uh, we didn't do a very good job uh, protecting uh, the federal facilities doing this uh, because we didn't have situational awareness as we should have, and we didn't employ the uh, capabilities, frankly, that we already have uh, as effectively as we should. So have you seen any changes come what as we, a result? What, what, yes, one of the things that we're finding now uh, is that um, the Department of Defense is looking at more, and, and other agencies also, we're getting a request to, they want more intelligence, they want more situational awareness, they want not just our readers and uh, the CCTVs, but they want to know if we can detect uh, information from Twitter and Facebook, which uh, we look for keywords uh, that uh, possibly provides an indication of the mood of a crowd, what they're going. That will give our security teams uh, and our senior management uh, better situation awareness so they can make more proactive decisions instead of reactive decisions. Um, so that's the biggest change is they're really in more of a focus on situational awareness than we've had in the past. All right, thank you. Okay, we're gonna move on to guard services next. So one of the questions that we had is, what is the advantage of utilizing GSA contracting vehicle for procurement of guard services? So um, Hope, if you'd like to explain that, what your thoughts are on that? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, well, currently under the NAICS code 561612, which is guard services, there are 107 contractors um, and they are situated um, all across the nation. So really you can utilize the platform to do market research. It also gives you the flexibility to take a look at our, our ceiling rates. So you can see what the prices are in the marketplace. So it's pretty transparent. Um, and really on top of that, it just provides you the flexibility to reduce your procurement timeline. So if, if there, there's data out there on, on the different firms, so you can see what their capabilities are relatively easily looking at their catalogs. So it's just a really good tool for contracting folks and the job series to take a look at what options are out there, what type of firms are out there, whether they are small businesses, large businesses, and you know the different um, acquisition planning. So you can be used for ag planning, and it can also be utilized to take a look at what rates would be fair and reasonable within a region. Oh, well, thank oh, you. It's like one you. of those things we, we talk about. Yes, it's much easier and it's faster, but it's interesting to get your viewpoint from it as well. So that's some good feedback. Thank you. Okay, on the armored vehicles, so I guess we'll move on to Oz and Mike. Let's see, um, one of the things, um, we're looking at the different technology and what do you have to develop the armored vehicle design structure? Are you able to handle that sort of thing? Yeah, Oz, you want me to take that one? I'll, I'll take yeah, that go one. Ahead. Sure. Okay, sorry, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, so for us, Chris, we, we consider ourselves relationship people. Um, we don't like to do transactions. We like to have long-term long -term relationships with our customer, which gives us a core understanding of what their needs are. Um, and then we try to marry that with what our core product is. With 15 years experience, we've developed uh, certainly a lot of systems to help us do that. Um, and it's one of the reasons we're trying to come to the table with an expanded offering to the GSA system. Uh, because we have a lot of capabilities outside of GSA, we haven't come in that include full vehicle uh, system development. Uh, we do a lot of work with Special Operations Command, with um, with other primes that develop vehicles. So we're very experienced in uh, the engineering requirements, the test and validation requirements, how to manufacture parts and components, 
um, and the like, uh, because we do that every day as part of our uh, non-GSA business. So for us, we're very well versed at developing full vehicle systems. We have um, uh, we have simulation programs in-house that can allow us to do things virtually to speed the development, uh, to make it less expensive. So uh, there's a lot here that we can bring to the table uh, to help sort of modernize the, the vehicle development process that um, we currently have. Oh, thank you. Oz, could you go into a little bit of detail of what you do have on contract, what people could expect to see on your GSA schedule contract? Um, people can uh, expect uh, right now we have on our platform in terms of vehicles, we start with the, with the smallest platform. Uh, you can start with a Toyota Camry or a Mercedes uh, C-Class or an E-Class. So we go all the way up to armoring buses that weigh about 35,000 pounds built with half inch ballistic steel. We've done them, uh, made those for uh, uh, tank and army command, about 25 of those that are still out in service in Kuwait and in Afghanistan. Um, so when, when we're talking about that kind of platform, um, that covers uh, pickups, SUVs, vans, cash and transit vehicles, tactical vehicles, uh, law enforcement support units, we also are, are currently working on uh, police unit platforms, which are um, not dressed up as a police vehicle, but are, are your regular uh, uh, unmarked vehicles. And we have integrated uh, uh, electrical systems and surveillance systems in those units that are uh, specific to customer requirement. Uh, so uh, those are the kind of platforms that we're working on. Uh, we also have uh, capabilities to, uh, uh, I think, Mike, uh, you might jump in on the weapons launching system that you guys, uh, we, we did for uh, one of our customers. Uh, sure. We, we have uh, a wealth of experience on, uh, uh, on gun platforms uh, and on their mounting systems through uh, the more traditional military work that we do. Um, and we've been able to integrate that into um, OEM or OE platforms on the manufacturing side and do it in a low, visib low visibility manner um, uh, to, to help that with, uh, with a lot of different mission sets. Yep. Excellent. Okay, well, let's move on. Uh, Hope, I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what you guys have on contract and, and how they can go about finding your products and services. Great. Um, yeah, so currently on contract, we have a full on suite of uh, guard services, SCAs, um, such as detention correction officer, guard one, guard two, court security officers, alarm monitors, um, switchboard operators. So really we're equipped to go in and provide full on suite services in terms of um, physical security. Um, in addition to that, we also have a mobile command center that can be deployed uh, nationwide and those rates are also uh, on our schedule. Um, so effectively, uh, we believe we have a full on suite to provide customers flexibility based on our prior contracts and dealings with um, both uh, commercial and government. Uh, we believe that we have a full on suite to provide full security. Okay, I was going to ask you too, what is included in the mobile command center? What type of equipment is on that? Okay, so the mobile command center um, has a kitchen area, microwave, refrigerator. It also has a full on um, um, desk operation centers where uh, it seats about seven, um, seven folks remotely there. Uh, so it's a 52 foot uh, container unit that we have broken out into uh, a meeting room as well as a rest area. Um, and, and it can be mobilized to a uh, physical location to provide uh, better positive control on, on a center. I mean, some of our clients utilize it for special events um, like uh, 4th of July, or if there's a lot of activity on that location for a particular date, we can mobilize the command center to allow for positive control of the environment. Excellent, thank you. Okay, Lars, I know we heard a lot about how to use the, the ordering guide, but I was like, can you give us a little bit more information about the company that you are with and, and what you can offer to our customers? 
<clears throat> yes, certainly. Uh, Identification Technology Partners uh, is a consulting firm. Uh, we have a contract that I that I execute for, with a nonprofit organization called Secure Technology Alliance, and that is the certification training that is uh, a requirement for that I just mentioned. Uh, we currently are on a contract with the DHS. And uh, some of those things are uh, dealing with identities and uh, on the TWIC program. Uh, one, of my, one of my roles is to write policy for the uh, equipment that is going to qualify for, for TWIC use at Seaports and some interoperability that we need to have between the TWIC and the PIM card. So it is a, uh, a consulting service. Uh, we were involved with the rollout of the duty CAC card way back when that was uh, when that was being when that was going out. That was in the early 2000s, and we have been providing, along with some other organizations, guidance to NIST and to GSA for uh, for system engineering and for identity management and credentialing. I would like to tie into something here that uh, that came up a little bit earlier with uh, the integration to video. Uh, a fiscal access control system is often the center of its local universe at the local site. That is the system that knows where people are authorized to go. It very often has intrusion detection as part of it. So it knows then what areas may be armed, what areas need to be disarmed as far as an alarm point is concerned before people go in and when people leave. And what those, when an area is alarmed, what shall be the action to a video system for video assessment and so on. And so it is, it, it is often the center of its local universe and having the integration to video that we just hear, that we just heard uh, a session on here with Roy Hayes and the situational awareness, that is something that integration tools, integration tools are developed for. And some of the, some of the system vendors, some of the system integration companies even have something that they can actually demonstrate to to uh, to customers. So that was a good session, and I just wanted to to make sure that we can fill in that little gap in there too. Oh, great! Thank you. And I've got a question about uh, migration strategies. Yeah, oh, good. Really, for both Roy from Systems Engineering and Lars uh, addressing PACs, migrating from uh, non-compliant systems to compliant. What can you how do we go about if, if, if our facility hasn't migrated to a HSPD 12 FIPS compliant system, how do we go about formulating a migration strategy? I would look at two things. The, uh, the first then, the first, the first piece here is identify what you currently have. And what do I mean with that? Look at what if, and I, I'm assuming now that you do have an access control system. Identify what you have, the brand and the version. Then contact one of the system integrators and say, "We have this brand with this version. Is this something that can be upgraded and be part of the of the uh, DSA APL?" I would say then that uh, the next step, and I would refer to this to to Roy. The one of the steps will then be, is this brand even listed on the APL? If that brand, let's say that we have a brand A that is installed and brand A also happened to be on the APL. Yes, okay, so the brand is there. The second then is, is the version, the firmware and the hardware version something that can be updated and, and be part of the, of the APL? If the answer to that is then there is a good chance that the existing system can be modernized and do and, 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 and be updated. If the equipment that you have is a brand that is not on the APL, then that's a bigger bridge to cross. The second thing is the card. What card technology do you have? Uh, one of the most common card technologies are 125 kilohertz proximity cards. And there are two schools of thoughts here. And uh, one way, one way to, to perhaps do this is to have a reader that can read both the old cards and then the new cards so that the legacy system, while you have that, while you have that being modernized, 
the people who have the old card can still use it. And as the new cards are in the hands of the people, you can flip that reader function on, switch that reader function on to the new card technology that is a different frequency and different operation, different, different operational capacity altogether. And gradually do it, gradually do it that way. Uh, however, there were some early migrations that also included cards with dual technologies on it, both the legacy and the new technology. And when you had cards with dual technologies, the legacy and the modern PIV, that was presented to a reader that had the legacy and the modern PIV technology, then the system was trying to process both pieces of the card. And that led to, to uh, yeah, that, that led to problems. So these are my two, okay. two points. And I would refer that to Roy to complete, to complete this because Roy has been in the seat of doing that, doing some yes, migration. Roy. Well, uh, what Lars says is, I will echo. Um, I mean, um, a lot of it I would repeat uh, is that what he's already said, establishing um, your existing technology inventory as far as your access control system is concerned. Um, once you establish that baseline, understanding the current te car technology, one of the problems with transitioning from a legacy system to the new uh, approved systems is you have to maintain the security profile of the facility while you're doing the upgrade. Now, we've faced that problem a number of times. We upgraded uh, the Missile Defense Agency and all its sites, uh, but we had to maintain the security of each site while we were doing this transition. So one of the things that the most time consuming thing is wiring. If we can use the existing wires, we can cut down a lot of the times on a transition to a new system. Uh, if the system is um, on the APL, then there is a chance that if they've upgraded the readers, we can normally upgrade the readers and upgrade the, the PACS board, the uh, physical access control system uh, boards, and we can move forward and reload the new software. However, the, the, I think the primary concern is always maintaining that security profile of the facility. And one way you do that is that you uh, is your installation process and make sure that you look at uh, probably installing the system simultaneously while leaving the existing system up. That comes into play when you're getting ready to utilize the same system. So oftentimes we can load computers, we can get the panels talking all prior to cutting over reader. And we normally do a reader cut over one by one, therefore we never leave a facility unprotected. We have a great deal of experience doing this. I said we did it for the most of the defense agency. We had to keep up over 3 million square feet of uh, space secured while we're doing wow. it. We're currently doing that for the uh, the uh, the National Transportation Safety Board and their, and their facility. We also are uh, supporting the Pentagon Force Protection Agency, the subcontractor, while we've had to upgrade their facilities and, and keep it operational. So the key thing is understanding the, the existing system as Lars said, understanding your, your car technology and planning the installation process with the mindset that the security profile of the facility has to stay in place. And you can do it. And uh, while it's a little bit painful, you can minimize the impact on the end user by going through this process. Great discussion. Thank you so much for that information. Um, Hope, I did have a question come in for you about on those mobile command centers? Are those for purchase or for lease or both? Um, well, currently our mobile command centers um, for lease only. Okay. Um, we, we did customize the entire command center. I mean, so I guess maybe down the line, we could uh, possibly offer them for purchase, but um, currently we're just leasing them. Okay. Thank you. Okay, and then Oz, I had a question for you and Mike about used armor vehicles and how does that come in if people want to upgrade? Uh, I'll, I'll take on this, Mike. Uh, the upgrade on used armored vehicles is, uh, is mainly on transparent armor. It is very, very much possible. Uh, transparent armor has a life cycle of, uh, of five years, give and take. Um, after that, it starts delaminating. I think uh, whoever's posed to the question, uh, 
might have had experience or because uh, because that's the lifespan you have on transparent armor it will stop projectiles yes it will but then you will not have the visibility to to go where you want to go because either it will delaminate or it will turn yellow uh when it comes to terms of suspension um components tires brake components uh think about it as when when you buy a new car you have it for five years i always tell this to people to try to understand the customers is that if you buy a brand new car after five years its book value is zero think about it as an armored vehicle you're putting a lot of weight on that unit and and that unit even when it's being well serviced needs to have some major servicing done after every two and a half to three years so which requires yes glass to be replaced suspension components to be upgraded and uh, mainly looked at the foundation of the vehicle because when a lot of weight is put on that vehicle the suspension articulates it moves uh we don't know what it's been through it's it's always good to look at the foundation and uh yeah get their maintenance done there are plans out there that we can work with okay great okay so it looks like we have about two minutes remaining uh so this might need to be the last question and someone did ask about emt certification so um hope i guess that would be you um you know, different levels that are required, one, two, and three of EMT certification. Can you answer that? I'm unsure uh, what the question is. Come again. Okay. Um, yeah. Do you have EMT, I guess, do you have EMT certifi certified services on your contract? Um, well, currently on, on our contract, no, uh, we don't have any EMT is listed as a specific um, labor category. Okay. Um, Yes. Okay. All right. Thanks. Okay. Since that was really short, maybe I can squeeze in one more. Um, a question of the difference between security and IT. Is there a quick answer for that? Either Lars or Roy? <laughs> well, there's no quick answer. So I mean, we have two minutes <laughs> left. We can talk about this for the rest of the session and more. Um, okay. Security system is, uh, is an information technology system. Uh, it's a computer, it has uh, processors and memories and things of that nature, which is the definition of a, of a computer system, an IT system. However, there are policies and procedures that go along with this IT system that we call a physical access control system. Lars, uh, looking at you. Lars? Yeah, hello. Oh, I'm and sorry, I was breaking up there a little bit. They were just asking the difference between IT and security. Oh, they're close. Very abbreviated. <laughs> yeah, okay. They're, they're closely related in that uh, a fiscal access control system touches in both directions. It touches the fiscal security in who, who have access to what resource. It also touches IT security because in, in, the, in the view now of, of NIST and others, a fiscal access control system is a node on a federal network. And we have the identities that are federated and move between different organizations and different sources. So yes, a, 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 an access control system is connected to a federal network and you have user databases, you have operator databases with different partitions and different functions, what they can do in the access control system. And then of course you have the, the people that are actually going through the, the actual doors and get into the fiscal areas. So it, it touches in both directions. Uh, I should also point out that the uh, one of the services that I did mention from IDTP, we have been uh, asked from time to time to provide an independent uh, third party uh, assessment of, of an installed system, a, a acceptance test, if you will. Okay. Hey, Chris, let me add one quick thing to oh, it, sure. please. Uh, you've already had the convergence of physical and uh, IT security. I mean, as I said earlier, a physical access control system is a specialized IT system. Uh, the problem is that the organizations are still separate. And uh, as long as they're treated as separate domains, you will never have complete security. They will have to integrate uh, 
And uh, I just want to make that statement that you you have to look Very at these point. systems operating in tandem. Okay. That's Excellent. All. Thank you. Very good, Roy. Very good point, Roy. Thank you. Okay. Did our uh, contracting folks have any questions that they want to ask real quick? Anything else? Okay, well, I guess that will be it for our panel discussion for right now. And you know, thank you guys so much for joining us. It's a, a, a wonderful opportunity to get to ask you these questions and, and have you all here together. So we certainly appreciate it. All right, great. Yes, thank you to our panel. And thank you again, Chris, and for just being such a great uh, Q&A facilitator. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to Mary and we're going to go to our last segment. Thank you, Tanika. Thank you, panel. And thank you, Chris Ann. Great information for our audience. And we've had several comments in the chat from people who said that this was very valuable to them. Thank you all. And thank you all for joining us. I'm going to pass it over back again to Chris Ann Neswadomi to recap what we've learned and close out our day. So our GSA Business Development Specialist, Chris Ann Neswadomi, take it away. Okay, once again, all right, making sure I'm unmuted and on camera. So anyway, I, it has been wonderful to have this opportunity to talk to you guys. And we want to thank you for you know, all that you have done with helping us out, our industry partners, the contracting folks. And um, it's just a lot of people that come together to, to make this happen. And we really wanted to highlight what we have with the security and protection. Uh, Tina Cox opening it up from DHS. You know, we really appreciate that. And I think we got some really good information as far as what, you know, DIU, uh, <laughs> DIU as far as what the different um, categories can do and the different um, industry partners. It's very varied, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. But as far as we talked about the guard services, um, loved seeing Murray with the canines. We got a lot of great information about the packs and as far as the order guide, which I really would, you know, emphasize if that is something that's coming up in your uh, procurement or acquisition needs to really take a look at that ordering guide. Um, you know, with the armored vehicles, that's always a, a very interesting topic, but it has such uh, ramifications with it. So we're glad to have that information on the mobile command centers. But before we conclude, I just wanted to bring up a few things as far as the trends that Tina did mention was the um, the SUAS, the small unmanned aerial systems are also drones that that is something that we have been working with as well with DIU, which is the Defense Innovation Unit. It is a part of DOD. And they were looking at um, the short range reconnaissance for inexpensive rucksack portable vertical takeoff and landing type of drones, or they call them the you know, UASs. And what they were doing was making sure that the drones that they were looking into were compatible um, and in in line with the um, National Defense Authoriz Authorization Act. And so they went out and looked at vendors. They're not saying that you can't buy it from other ones, but these are ones that they have seen that have gone through the process and that they are, I think it was Section 848 compliant. So in working with them, when they approved these SUAS drone contractors, we put those on the GSA schedule contract. So if that is something that's coming up um, that you are interested in, know that the five drone contractors that we have have also been um, looked at and verified with DIU. Um, some of the other things that people are unaware is that we have helicopters on the GSA schedule contract. We talked about the Washington Navy Yard. We have Marine Craft. 
um, you know, body armor, riot gear, duty gear, all that type of equipment is available. Surveillance systems, one of the new things we keep hearing about lately is the modular mobile surveillance systems or the M2S2. And basically, uh, in a nutshell, it's everything but weapons and ammunition. So as far as the whole schedule program goes, the GSA multi award schedule, we try and provide what it is that our customers are looking for. So as I had mentioned earlier, one of the things that, that we ask is that you talk to us and let us know what it is that you need and we can work with vendors um, to get their product solutions added to the GSA schedule program. If you're having difficulty finding what you need, you can reach out to us and we can help you with that market research as far as doing that MRAS that I mentioned to you earlier. Um, we have a whole group of people that are available to help you in that case division. So we've got our customer service directors, national account managers. They are all there ready to help you. It's all a no cost service. And then um, and, and just if you're a GSA contractor and you are having trouble connecting with the federal customers, you know, let us know and we can set up a one on one meeting with you to try and help you develop a, a marketing plan that's, you know, specialized for your particular situation. So anyway, I, I, I hope that we have provided a good overview of the security and protection and want to let you know that we're here to try and make your job easier. So you let us know how we can help you. And uh, we would love to be in contact with you later. So if there is anything that we can do, please just let us know. And I think that is, that's a wrap. Thank you very much, Chris Ann. Uh, really great day today with lots of great information shared. One of our last questions that we had in the Q&A pod was, if I have questions, who can I contact? And on the last slide, I believe we have your contact information and you can act as the bridge that can uh, bring a customer to the place where they need to go. I also think that there was other information shared for contacts inside of those presentations, which will be shared in the uh, gsa.gov slash FAST website, where you can see the slides from today and all of that information. Here we are with Chris Ann's slide as the, as the last one. Uh, you can email Chris or call her. She's happy to help. Um, we appreciate all of you attending. And I would like to turn the floor back over to my co-host, Ms. Tanika Jenkins, for a few final notes and information that will be useful to you. All right, thank you all for joining us. So I'm repeating myself here, but it's good information to know. Um, so COPs will be issued uh, in the next three weeks um, via email and you will receive three COPs. Um, PDF copies of today's event are available now. I actually went on to gsa.gov slash fast F-A-S-T, and I was successful in downloading a PDF version of today's presentation. Um, in a week or so, we will also uh, post the video recordings um, and also the official Q&A document, which will list all the questions and answers. Um, and one more thing, um, stay tuned because on August 18th, uh, we will close out our FAST series for the, for the year with the facilities maintenance topic. Um, so on August 18th, uh, join us then. Uh, I'll be back as a host. Um, for more information on how to register, go to gsa.gov slash F-A-S-T. Um, and um, thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks everyone. Appreciate it so much.